No. Yeah. Good evening, sir. So we are the voice. Time. Yeah. yeah. Maybe, can we start the proceedings now? Yeah. 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 Up to you. Yeah. Yeah. Gopika, you may make the uh, customer. So Ramesh and Roshinda, I'll be with you for some time. And then I'll have to leave because I have another meeting with you. <laughs> Too many meetings. Okay. This is, uh, you know, whatever time you give us is a privilege. Uh, uh, no, 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 no. Yes. We're going to have, we went from Chimai. We're going to have you you another talk to Delhi uh, section. I'll okay. organize. Okay. And I'll okay. give half the credit to Chimai. Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine, sir. Uh, always you are there with your uh, support and blessings. Thank you so much. Why is Gopika so sad today? Uh, not at all, sir. Yeah, you, you used to smile always. Today you don't smile. <laughs> no, I'm still smiling. Yes, sir. I'm happy only. I'm just joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. Go ahead. Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. So, good evening and good morning, everyone. Welcome to another session of Alpha Series Talk. It's indeed a great privilege to partake in this grand event, which is honored with the presence of the luminaries of the discipline. Today's Alpha talk, followed by panel discussion, is organized by IEEE MPTS Kerala Action Chapter. We are really fortunate to have Dr. Rashoda Henderson and Dr. Ramesh Gupta as the speakers of the evening. As you are aware, this session is going live in YouTube now. Before we officially kickstart the event, I would like to draw your attention to a few things. The participants will have the opportunity to submit their queries into the chat box. You may send your questions at any time during the presentation. We will collect and address them during the Q&A at the end of the talk. We also request you to turn off your audio and video and maintain the same throughout the entire session. We wish you all a wonderful and constructive learn from leaders and learn from legends experience. Now I hand over the podium to Mr. Anzit signed this VSSE to host the further proceedings of the evening. Over to you, Arjit. Good evening. I guess I'm audible. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, you're audible. Very much audible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, good evening and also good morning to everyone from India's presentation. On behalf of today's event, as we, uh, we already mentioned last month, we had launched uh, a new series of webinar under the name L4, which stands for Learn from Leaders, Learn from Legends, in which uh, we'll be inviting stalwarts from academia as well as industry in this field of microengineering to share their knowledge and experiences. Today's event is a continuation of the series. Uh, in fact, today we have two consecutive technical talks followed by a panel discussion. For the first talk, we have with us Dr. Rashonda Anderson, University of Texas, Dallas, and she'll be talking on integration and packaging strategy CMOS. I heartily welcome Dr. Anderson for being with us today. Then the second talk will be delivered by Dr. Ramesh Gupta, Chair of MTTS Marketing and Communication Committee, and he will be speaking on satellite systems for emerging telecom infrastructure. I welcome Dr. Gupta on behalf of MTTS Kerala. I also welcome Professor Sivan Cole, IIT Delhi. We are really grateful to him for his continuous support towards our chapter. We also are lucky to have with us other dignitaries like Dr. Javed Siddiqui, Dr. Emmanuel, Dr. Deepdeep Sharkar. I heartily welcome them and extend our sincere gratitude on behalf of MTTS Kerala. I also welcome Dr. Chinma Shah, Chair and Founder of MPTS Kerala, without whose able leadership, guidance and support, this event would never have been possible. Finally, I also welcome all participants for registering and being with us today. I'm sure you'll have a lot of takeaways from today's session. With this, I request the host to go ahead with the, with the event proceedings. Thank you all. Thank you, Urijit. Uh, may I request Professor Call uh, to say a few words uh, to start the uh, session as an inaugural address? So I'm not going to take much time. Uh, yes. First of all, I would like to formally welcome Ashanda on behalf of Kerala section on my personal behalf. Uh, we have been friends for ages now in EDCOM and other meetings in the education committee. And she's very dynamic and she handled the education committee. She took over from Ramesh 
and she's handling it very well and she is the president elect and we're sure that she will come to india many times she has been coming and i came to know that she has few students from india and she likes them so the you know title of a talk uh, integration and package strategy these are two very important areas and uh, this is for millimeter wave cmos and you know that in india scl has some facility to do these kind of circuits at low frequencies we need to move to higher uh frequencies uh, that means lower nanometer gates so i think this talk will be very interesting for them so uh, though we don't have uh, foundry at that frequencies but i think designers are excellent so foundry services can be used anywhere so welcome prashanda again to you and shortly you will hear from us again for another talk don't worry about it then we have ramesh is also a very good friend and i worked with him under education committee the india business and he's now chair of a very important committee called marcom and uh, is basically for publicity and uh, he has done a wonderful job uh, by roping in good people and uh, advertising and uh, maybe he'll talk a little bit about it so his talk is satellite system in fact satellite is is core to his heart he has been working for many many years on the satellite system but and this particular talk i think he's going to talk about telecom infra which is very useful for india so uh, welcome ramesh and uh, uh, i hope the audience will enjoy both the talks uh, from now as far as the you know we, you have seen that uh, chinmay said l4 i know that within few weeks he will say l5 then l6 somebody from delhi will uh, this is very nice and uh, as somebody was mentioned before we started this Uh, program i don't know whether you had joined uh, you know if you look at the get up and the and posters and other things i think they are perfected they have excellent student designers i'm sure uh, they have done it in a very very professional way and this is how it should be done so that is done now webinars are there practically every hour i get a call uh, that there is a webinar today webinar today and i think students are enjoying they are getting a lot of benefits i had a meeting vision meeting for iit jammu Two hours back, and I recommended to them that you should do the way Chinma is doing to invite people uh, to give talks, so that you know what's latest in these technologies. So you'll hear from them also shortly because it's a five-year-old IIT. There are a lot of funds. They set up very good facilities. So uh, I think we need to integrate. Now webinars are good. I know that when you come go for promotions, teachers go for promotions, student goes for job. Webinars alone don't help. so we need to do now second level now second level as we mentioned last time also is uh, basically publications and if you see the record both of you are in edcom i think publication record from india is not very impressive it is good uh, it's not very impressive especially in the transaction antenna propagation transaction ieee <coughs> and wireless guided wave letters micro magazine some articles are coming but it's not uh, when you look at china is phenomenal so this is something we need to do we are capable but uh, the papers cannot be published by professor call and chinmay is few papers will come out but i think it is the students who have to rope in phd students post docs motivate them and uh, that is the next phase and how we do it maybe we call uh, how to write papers by our famous edcom member <laughs> who has been editor on the george ponchik we should actually have a call with and the second thing which is coming now you know in india we have a, a program called atmanirbhar means self reliant and after this covid thing so under this you know prime minister modi is a uh, lot of money is available if you want to venture into some new technology development but key part there is innovation you have to have something innovate and then translate into the product so if you want to innovate you have to preserve the innovation so the, that is very important is ip intellectual property which we are very poor at so we must encourage our students phd students researchers to file patents when they are doing research so that we can build a pool of patents and this can be monetized they will be benefited country will be benefited this is the second thing now third important thing which uh, ramesh will probably touch upon later is uh, you know they started under sigma ye some grant to iit kanpur 
and uh, this is basically to uh, have student projects students to work on projects because we don't have i mark this year to keep them motivated uh, he will tell you more about it so we have uh, some sort of networking among students by giving these project grants and monitoring by students and as i mentioned last time also i along with chinmay we will initiate uh, a networking which is slightly different from that we will generate our own money maybe 10 20 projects will fund so student will work at one of these places for two months so maybe within a month's time we'll work out details and we'll share with the adcom how to do it we don't need adcom money for that i'll generate the money here to start with about 10 to 20 and uh, to just give me an idea it's already starting in a different way yesterday <coughs> somebody talked to me that there is a very big project related to radio astronomy which was open i think there is an entry from chinmay's uh, place also it is swan antenna it is a broadband antenna 50 megahertz to 800 megahertz and this was thrown open to students and we have 39 entries already and i am one of the jury members that's why i know it and we are right now doing the shortlisting and uh, whichever design very nice very nice designs have come up from colleges across the country and once we have those designs approved then we'll be funding it for fabrication testing and i'm sure many of them will result in the papers so these are some efforts uh, and as and when you come next time on a webinar you will see more of them so you'll have to wait 3 4 weeks before i tag on to chinmay and announce formally a big networking program for undergrad phd students which will be given a scholarship to them equal to some 3 400 $400 and they can actually come two months to one of these institutes to do project and at the end of the thing i would like to have a paper out of these students maybe in a conference so this is all what i need to say but i think uh, very good opportunities exist now for students and we have to see to that how we grow our student community the last point uh, which you would have got a report from ieee uh, the lady who sends the report on the membership is declining worldwide and uh, because we are organizing now too many webinars and i talk to students uh, they are very keen though we don't have restriction that you have to be necessarily mtt member but if you tell them that be mtt member you will get some more benefits like these projects and other things i'm sure they are waiting for november december time because they would like to start the membership from january so you will find i think from january onwards the membership will really go exponentially from india and uh, all these volunteers who are listening to me they have to contribute i'm going to request everybody telephonically how many members came from your chapter how many members you came and i'm sure in in 2021 we should have at least 4 to 500 members coming from india it's not a big job so i'll assure you that as far as both adcom members and the next president is there president elect so this will be a very good thing if we can have 4 to 500 members and uh, higher number of publications and motivate at least 10 to 20 students to do projects in rf and we can i am planning to divide uh, 50% women 50% men so that you know we have equal balance between the uh, females and males so together i think it will be a very good heterogeneous mix of people and we can fund some in antenna some in microwave there is no boundary and at the end of the day we will see that how many of them can publish papers and will send you the data ramesh so that you can put it in the marketing that <laughs> this is what we did sure with these few words i once again welcome rushanda and ramesh thank you for coming and accepting chinmay's uh, uh, invitation and we are really grateful to both of you and we are looking forward to your physical presence in 2021 imark obviously 2022 you have to come because that will be the 10th year of imark and after that we are holding one in kharagpur and chinmay is interested in holding it there will do much better than what we have been doing in the past and maybe newer ideas like l4 some new ideas we have devidi uh, there and by the way and you would have seen announcement from iic bangalore devadi has started again a webinar series with experts from abroad have a look at iic website i looked at it today i think he has scheduled four or five very nice interesting talks in next couple of months so you can see that i think everybody is running now and uh, it's i think a win win situation for the students and uh, i'm sure uh, when you go back and we send you the reports adcom will be really happy to notice the progress in india thank you very much and uh, 
have a nice event and have a nice panel session. And later you send me the video so that I can watch the two talks. Unfortunately, I have to go because there's an important meeting uh, after about 15 minutes and uh, we'll be in touch. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, sir. You have been always a source of inspiration and motivation to all of us uh, youngsters as well. Uh, so in spite of your busy schedule, you have always uh, been with us and you have been the mentor uh, in behind this NTTS Kerala chapter along with Professor Siddiqui and others. So no, I'm at uh, rest of, uh, you do everything. <laughs> I just <laughs> guide. That's all. Yes. But uh, as I said in last time, you know, I'm very, very happy that, you know, the seed which we have put uh, has now grown. Really, we, I can count 50, 60 excellent volunteers from India now. Right. Thank you. Very that's, much. A, that's the uh, plus point. And, uh, you know, MTT was looking for volunteers. Now you don't need to look at it. Pick and choose. There's so many of them now. Available. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks. And I'll be disconnecting with Shanda and Ramesh. So sorry for yeah, that, but I will definitely watch your video uh, after Chilmai sends me the YouTube link. Thank you very much. Yeah, before you disconnect, you. I, I do want to thank you, uh, Professor Call, for all the efforts and energy. I think, you yeah. know, all through my work to, with education Markham, and with India uh, Business Subcommittee, you have been the force behind and uh, keep me mot motivated. Actually, that's awesome. You have Thank been you. pushing me, Vishanda, from the <laughs> Education Committee earlier. You are there. Rishanda, by the way, Rhonda got an award. Congrats. Uh, please convey congrats, congratulations to her. And I'll send her the kit as promised. And also to okay. your uh, chapter. What is that? Uh, okay. Barton Hill. Yes. So these two okay. are on my mind. Whenever things open up, I'll do that. Thank okay. you very much. Thanks. Have a nice time. Thank, Thank you. Very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much, sir. So, so I'm disconnecting now. Yes, sir. Sure. Okay. Bye. So I have permission to disconnect. <laughs> sure, sir. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you again. <laughs> yeah. So before we uh, go to the actual proceedings, uh, you know, we don't. We, I really don't want to go to very formal because uh, I have a kind of short speech, but I'll probably try to skip that one or I'll try to truncate it in one or two minutes. So before that, can I uh, request uh, Professor Siddiqui to uh, say a few words just for a couple of minutes, because he is the person who is behind this MTTS Kerala chapter. So whenever we do something, we always recognize and acknowledge his contributions. Uh, thank you very much, Inui. But as I said, the idea is okay, but the execution is what takes all the effort. And you have done a commendable job in uh, executing this program and you know, having coming up with this idea and transmitting it to something useful. And in this pandemic situation, I can see having been attending your events for all the all the events that you have conducted, and the attendance is fantastic, 70 to 80 to 100, and about 100 for most of them. And I'm sure these student volunteers that you have gathered, we have a problem in uh, in Kolkata, like retaining student student members. But your you know your section, your your chapter in Kerala, they have been commendable job. In this first year, you have so many volunteers in your team, and as well as you know like students, other students who motivate them to attend these lectures and benefit from them. So all the effort goes to you and your team. Kerala has always been a very inspiring state, and the section has always been very vibrant. And uh, you are showing them, uh, you are taking up the mantle and showing them the path you are, you are generating. The, you are a future leader, and you are generating more leaders. You are not the students that you have like, gathered in your team. So I wish you all the best for your future endeavors. And thanks to Dr. Ramesh Gupta and Dr. Rashonda for taking this invite and, uh, you know, like delivering this stuff. We are really grateful. Unfortunately, we are, we are missing your physical presence, but hopefully after the pandemic, we will see you uh, sometime in India very soon, probably in the coming year. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you, you very Professor much, Professor Siddiqui. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, you have always uh, been with us in all fronts, technical as well as uh, guidance, administrative, so as I said, I'll, I, I won't take much time. I thought I'll uh, say a few words about the MTTS Kerala chapter and N4 series. But uh, you know, we oh, really want to go to the technical part, but I'll just uh, take a couple of minutes or so. 
once again good morning and uh, good evening uh, and good afternoon to all the delegates uh, special thanks to the society leaders and today we have uh, professor rashonda and dr gupta with us who are indeed uh, leaders and legends in all fronts so as the name suggests uh, learn from leaders and learn from legends this is the third version of that and today we are going to have the fourth and fifth technical talk under this mtts l4 uh, kerala series and first panel discussion that we are going to have on a very exciting topic on opportunities in research and academic fronts and we have uh, the in, uh, incidentally the chair of education committee dr rashunda and chair of uh, marketing committee dr gupta so they are the best person to lead the panels along with the technical talks and for your information i will be just moderating the panel and once again uh, thanks to my office bearers the team and the mentors and the motivators and special thanks to the society always because mtt i i closely work with both aps and mtt societies and both the societies are equally generous on certain things mtt gives a uh, more freedom and uh, more mileage in terms of uh, focused uh, webinars and this is also a webinar which we didn't initially think that we'll start in this way we just uh, thought of as a pandemic initiative in the first week of april but then it has taken this particular shape because of contribution of all of you all the participants and all the colleagues of course and as uh, we mentioned during the inauguration in presence of president himself dr ala that this is not going to be a single event we are going to have different versions in fact after that on the same day we had a talk by professor nuno carvalho then next week we had dr gautam uitas with a fantastic talk and few more there are, are there in pipeline on technical as well as the panel fronts so uh, i'll just uh, take uh, another couple of minutes maybe to sh you know tune the events like what are the proceedings that we are going to have today so for that i'm going to share the screen let me know when the screens are visible yes sir yeah so this is our uh, flyer and uh, you know you have already seen that so this event comprises of three components first component is the talk by dr rashunda handerson my colleague uh, dr emmanuel raja is going to chair that particular session and then the second talk uh, by dr ramesh gupta which will be chaired by dr devdeep sharkar and then we will have the panel discussion on ieee mtts role in expansion of educational and research opportunities and this is the timeline probably we are uh, behind by 7 to 8 minutes but uh, we'll try to make it up and we don't want to uh, prolong also so i request uh, the speakers also to follow the timeline each of them have 35 minutes which can be divided as 30 plus 5 or 28 plus 7 whatever way you uh, uh, go after the technical talks in between we have a virtual photo shoot for a couple of minutes or so and then we'll go to the panel part and this is the the special day september 17th when we had the inauguration of this l4 along with two technical talks by professor call and uh, dr nuno carvalho you can see the flyers and this is the special certificate that was generated and that was officially inaugurated in this virtual podium just a couple of weeks before and this is the uh, you know the snap of that particular event uh, we have uh, in a process to report these in mtts magazine i hope it will be coming out i have uh, sent it to uh, you know the people and this is not only the activities in addition we are having many more events uh, different kind of webinars talks panel discussions this one is the last one under l4 by uh, dr gautam chattopadhyay oh sorry we had also one more in collaboration with aps uh, dl i to be dl aps by 11 sigbi that was jointly organized by uh, l4 series and the uh, aps and mtts gc button is chapter so with this i uh, stop sharing because i really don't want to delay uh, all of us are waiting for this technical part so now i request uh, dr uh, emmanuel raja to take care of the first technical talk over to you dr raja thank you very much thank you dr chinmay and good evening to all those Uh, from india and good morning to those across the globe i welcome you warmly to the first uh, talk in this l4 uh, series and talk is going to be on integration and packaging strategies for millimeter wave c 
CMOS. I'm pretty sure many of you are eagerly uh, waiting to learn from what Dr. Rashunda Henderson has to say. Uh, before that, let me just give you uh, briefly introduce uh, Dr. Rashunda Henderson. She's from the University of Texas at Dallas, uh, Richardson in Texas, USA. Uh, she received the BSE degree from uh, Tuskegee University from Alabama in 1992 and the MS and PhD degrees in electrical engineering from the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, Michigan in 1994 and 1999 respectively. From 1999 to 2007, she worked as an R&D device engineer at Freescale Semiconductors. Since 2007, she has been researching novel passive components and integration techniques for millimeter wave circuits and systems. She advises a team of students in the design, fabrication, and characterization of high-performance passive components, antennas, and packages for frequencies operating through 325 gigahertz. Dr. Henderson is a senior member of the IEEE and an elected member of the MPTS Administrative Committee, currently serving as the chair of the Education Committee. So we warmly welcome you, ma'am, and it's a pleasure for us to have you. So over to you now. You are mute, uh, Rashonda. Okay. Okay. Sorry. You can hear me now? Yep. Okay. Very good. So thank you very much for the introduction. Thank you for the invitation. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. As uh, was mentioned, the title of the presentation is integration and packaging strategies for millimeter wave CMOS. Um, let me make sure I can move. So uh, today I'm going to talk about one particular application. Uh, associated with the, the, some of the research that I've done at UT Dallas. And the outline is that I'll give a motivation behind the work, talk about uh, front end module circuits. I'm not sure, <clears throat> excuse me, if uh, everyone on the call, uh, uh, all of you are RF engineers or microwave engineers, but when I say front end, I mean those uh, passive circuits that oftentimes are in the front of uh, the circuit, the communication systems, for example. Uh, then I'll talk about this uh, transition from an IC to a package and how you would excite ultimately a dielectric waveguide. And then I'll talk about a package to waveguide transition and then where we stand in terms of the future work. So this is uh, a, a couple of photos that uh, show uh, a data center uh, and the type of uh, wireline connections that are used in data centers. And so given the situation around the globe right now with COVID, we are all more uh, inclined to uh, appreciate data centers that allow us to have higher bandwidth uh, and higher speeds. You know, this this conversation or the, the meeting that we're, we're having now in and of itself gives us the ability to all come together and uh, in a virtual framework. And so you can have in a data center, for example, copper, or you could have a fiber as your interconnect. And, and so they have different benefits. Uh, and so on the left, you're just seeing what would happen if you cut the, uh, the plastic and see what the copper looks like and what the fiber looks like. And then on the right side, you're just seeing what the back of a rack of a data center might look like with copper and uh, fiber optic cables. So uh, the work that I'm uh, going to talk about is really motivated behind the data center uh, bottleneck, for example. So uh, the copper solution that people use is, is prevalent and uh, is primarily used in these data centers, but oftentimes uh, there's a, a, a minimum capacity or maximum capacity that can be achieved and so if you look at this slide, it says up to 60 gigabits per second per channel. And so that can um, uh, be limited. And as we said, in this situation that we're in right now with COVID, we need as much bandwidth as we can get. 
And so the option uh, for replacing the the the, the, um, the copper would be the uh, the the optical fiber. And so with the optical fiber, you can get up to 300 gigabits per second per channel. And so that is uh, great for bandwidth, great for speed, uh, but you have to deal with the electrical to optical interface. And so that is very inefficient. And uh, so for that reason, uh, you have the frowns. And an option that has been circulated amongst RFIC um, engineers is the concept of using what's called a dielectric waveguide. And so the, the idea is that this waveguide could provide you with greater than 100 gigabits per second per channel. This is a plastic structure, uh, and it has all smiles throughout this sort of list. It's energy efficient. Uh, the interface would uh, be purely electrical, and so you wouldn't have to deal with some uh, non-idealities that are found in the channel. So the work that I'm uh, going to talk about is actually how would you build a wireline communication system using uh, a dielectric waveguide, and we're trying to use a little bit more uh, robust uh, dielectric waveguide. So this slide shows the loss uh, over frequency for different types of uh, transmission lines. And so if you're an RF engineer, a microwave engineer, you're very familiar with microstrip uh, transmission line, but you also see here that it has the highest uh, loss. And that has uh, to do with the dielectric material. It has to do with the, the conductivity of the metal. And so uh, it has limitations. And then below that is the rectangular waveguide. And so that has better performance. But what is also shown, shown on this graph is that as you start to just use purely dielectric, you get rid of that metallic loss, that metallic attenuation. And then on the right side, are, is what's shown there's some examples of what this dielectric waveguide might look like. And so you see with the hand, it's just something you can bend very, very easily. So the thought is that this would be easy to fabricate and cheap uh, for use in mass production. So um, I've been working on this project now since about 2017 with uh, two different professors, and I'll talk about their role as well as what we do. But the goal is to try to approach the data bandwidth uh, that I mentioned for the optical system. But you're going to bypass those optical communications challenges, uh, which is realizing these optical components and silicon integrated circuits and aiming for, um, in, in this, this alignment for the optical components. So if we can design and fabricate on my side the transitions from the IC to the wave guide or the dielectric wave guide, um, then and that interconnect multiple RF signals generated from low cost CMOS ICs, uh, then we, we see ourselves being able to provide another solution to uh, what's currently available now. So there are people that have been doing this work. Uh, as you see in this slide, I show some work that has happened back in 2011, in fact. Uh, and, and so, like I said, I think this work is mostly driven or a lot of times driven from the RFIC uh, side of things. And so you see here at the top left uh, some photos of the actual uh, circuit uh, and, and what things would look like. So they're proposing uh, a 57 gigahertz a transmit and, uh, 80, and 80 gigahertz transmit and receive uh, circuits. And then uh, the signal is transmitted through antennas shown here, but basically uh, the waveguide is placed on top of those chips. So the implementation is seen at the upper left. And so the idea is that this is just a plastic waveguide. And then it was demonstrated for a one meter uh, example where they're just using this polystyrene waveguide and they're showing that they can take a, a picture on one side and, and then you see the result on the other side or in the receive. And uh, also at UCLA, They've done some work and they uh, did a little bit better type of uh, waveguide than just the plastic. And so they have something that's called an air core and a plastic shield. But once again, they're using an antenna to excite the waveguide at 60 gigahertz, and then they're receiving that signal. And then uh, at KU Leuven, um, 
they are doing quite a bit of work. Uh, I didn't include a table, which I should have, that really just shows you where the state of the art is. But they have been doing um, these dielectric um, fibers and these communication systems and have demonstrated some of the highest uh, data rates. But what I want to show in this picture is that if you have a chip and you fabricate on chip and antenna, then you can place this plastic waveguide in a couple of different formats. And then the one on the bottom left is showing a bond wire. So how do you deal with uh, integrating or being able to place that waveguide and not interfere with the bond wire? And then a more formal package, which is shown for a flip chip design. So our work is focused on a demonstration of 120 gigabits per second. And so we want to use two uh, millimeter wave frequencies 180 gigahertz and then uh, also 315 gigahertz. And not only that, but in order to actually increase the data rate, we want to use two polarizations. So we want to send a signal horizontally as well as vertically. And uh, we're once again using CMOS transceiver circuits in 65 nanometer technology. Um, and the idea is that we can increase that data rate. So once again, just focusing on combining the signals using an on-chip multiplexer and then transitioning the signal off the chip to the package. And then finally, really it's the package to waveguide transition. So on the bottom, I'm just showing you this uh, sort of like single line concept, but you have modulation on the left, your transition, not quite showing you what it's going to look like yet, the dielectric waveguide, then you transition the signal from that waveguide, and then you demodulate the signal. So what we found that we were responsible for the beginning of the project was uh, designing, like I said, this front end circuits, these multiplexers. And so I'll talk a little bit about that. And our multiplexer was really a diplexer. So it was just trying to combine or split two signals and uh, but to do that in 65 nanometer. So if you're an RF or a microwave engineer, typically you're, you have some substrate, whether it's silicon, high resistivity silicon, or it's some Rogers material and say two copper or metal layers. So your design of circuits is pretty straightforward. But when you, and fabrication as well, but when you're starting to design in 65 nanometer technology, which is what the RFIC people have to do, there's a lot of other things you have to take into consideration. So I'm not going to touch on the termination resistor or the, but I will share a little bit about the comparison of our measurements uh, with our model. And then once we designed the dive flexor, uh, we had to design the antenna that's really used to excite the signal. So I'll share some results from that. So uh, this is a block diagram uh, showing our intent, and we're trying to use a dielectric waveguide that's fabricated, and it's one meter long. Um, and so a professor uh, whose acronyms are DLM, he was responsible for that. And then the, the transceiver circuits uh, operating from 160 to 200 gigahertz, and then uh, 295 to 335 gigahertz were fabricated by another professor at UT Dallas. And so those signals are combined and then transmitted off the chip into the dielectric waveguide. So if you take a look at this image on the bottom, it's just showing what the diplexer or the multiplexer would be responsible for really channelizing uh, from essentially 140 or 160 gigahertz all the way up to say 380 gigahertz. So, so but we focus specifically on uh, two channels, uh, like I said, the 180 and then the um, 315 gigahertz. So just a little brief information about the diplexer design. So diplexer is really a combination of two filters. And um, you're either going to combine those signals or you're splitting them. But it's not a power divider, but it's, it's, it's really um, combining those signals and letting them propagate. Uh, so one of the what were the goals for them were to, to try to design something that's low in loss, has small area, and has high isolation. Now for this particular demonstration, we've separated the band so far away that the isolation is not as important. But we are trying to implement as much as 40 gigahertz 
and bandwidth. Uh, but we looked at two different filters and we have really two different results. One filter um, inherently will give you about 40 gigahertz and, or, I'm sorry, dot flexor will give you that, and it's a manifold dot flexor design. And the other one is a directional filter, and it only will give you about 10% or 20 gigahertz of bandwidth. So based on some of the limitations based in the on process, some of the limitations in we could only do the uh, directional design at 270 and 315 gigahertz, whereas the one um, that has a wider bandwidth, we could do it at 180 and 315 gigahertz. So um, what I show below is just how these two multiplexers or diplexers are realized. So the manifold design, as I mentioned, is two separate filters. In this case, we use a couple uh, nine band pass filter, which is pretty straightforward, but what you have to do is modify the length in order to uh, allow the input signal to pass through uh, filter one and show that band of uh, data, and then it would reflect, you have a reflect here at uh, this uh, third port, and then you, you design the length on the L1 so the same thing could happen. You have a reflect here coming out of port two and then you pass all the signal through port three. So that design is, uh, like I said, independent of the filter. Another kind is uh, called the directional filter multiplexer, and it is actually made up of different modules. So you can add or take away from these structures, and it's realized through using a, a coupler, quarter wave um, uh, coupler, uh, circuit, so it's really a four port, but the nice thing about it is it's small in size and it can be just added or subtracted, whereas this manifold design, you have to couple both uh, filters properly. So um, as I mentioned, we were responsible for fabricating or having this fabricated in 65 nanometer technology. And so I'm showing just some of the comparison of the simulation with the measurement. Um, so what you see in blue is the simulated results, and we modified our simulation to uh, take into account some of the, the issues that we ran into or some of the fabrication concepts because our first design was very um, basic. It didn't include the, the feed uh, structure and the pro pads, and so they count for several parasitics that you see in the results. But uh, the expectation is, as I mentioned, we would get 40 gigahertz of bandwidth at, centered at 180 gigahertz, and then we would also get 40 gigahertz at 315. Now, um, as uh, Professor Cool mentioned, uh, there's an, an interest even in India going into higher frequencies. So to take these measurements in and of themselves is very challenging. Um, it requires actually two different uh, waveguide module systems that we purchased, and um, so to take the measurements is, is no small feat, but um, my student and I worked together, and so we just show some of the scattering parameters. Uh, the amount of energy passing through is about 9 dB, which was lower than we expected, and then, the, but the reflection coefficient, the match was pretty good at 20 dB. So the second that design, which is the, um, directional filter, as I mentioned, it's much smaller in area. And so if you're an RFIC guy, you like that, but the performance was very limited. We had uh, about two dB more, and we had already mentioned that the bandwidth was not sufficient. So we stopped working on that particular project and moved forward with the um, manifold design. And I just want to highlight, this is the student who worked on this. In fact, she is the person who did uh, the majority of the framework for this research project, and she's a master's student. So she spent a lot of hours in my uh, lab uh, learning things and working on them. So after that first set of uh, designs, we uh, actually moved to a second tape out in 2018. And so what you're seeing is the incorporation of the, uh, well, I haven't talked about the antenna yet, but the diplexer, the original diplexer uh, has now been spread out so that it can take up less uh, area. I guess it, it takes up the same amount of area, but it's utilized more readily. So 
here's the 180 gigahertz uh, receiver circuit. And then this is the 315 gigahertz receiver circuits and other people are designing those, but we're designing the antenna, which I'll talk about. And then we also wanted to just see how do those filters perform? And so here they are. And the, the one feedback we've always gotten is they take up a lot of room. And so that's, you know, the thing in RF engineer or microwave engineering, uh, sometimes your designs are big compared to what I see people do. The next slide. Okay, so then this is just to show you the improvement of the performance of this di uh, the one port of the the diplexer. So um, it's a three port circuit. So most network analyzers, and especially especially those working up to these high frequencies, you do two port measurements. So how do you do a two port measurement with a three port circuit? You have to terminate one of the ports in, in 50 ohm and then take the measurement. So what I'm showing here in the lower left is if I terminate the two output ports and just try to see how much match at, do I have at the input port. And so in this particular case, I can only take measurements uh, centered around the 315. And so we see that we have a good match. Uh, I would use the other modules to take the measurements at the lower frequency. And then also uh, on this right side, I'm showing the two put excuse me, two port response, if I terminate the 50 ohm at uh, 50 ohm at the 180 gigahertz port. And so what you see is that we're getting about 5 dB of insertion loss. And so we had to fix a few things, but we went from minus 9 dB to minus 5 dB. So we uh, have improved performance. So now I just want to come back and revisit the system concept and, and sort of break it uh, out a little bit uh, more. So I mentioned earlier that we have um, a horizontal and vertical uh, signals that we need to transmit. And the idea behind that is we can double our capacity if we do that. So uh, once again, what we really would have is 180 and 315 gigahertz with what we call horizontal. So that needs to be combined. And then we do that on the vertical. And so those two signals, they're, uh, they are orthogonal to each other, so they can actually travel in the dielectric waveguide at the same time. And uh, theoretically, they won't have any issues. So then now the question is the launch. How do you launch the signal? How do you take what uh, has been designed on the chip and get it off of the chip onto this dielectric waveguide? And then how do you recapture it and then split it back up? So I'll talk about the dual band antenna in a, right now. So this is just to remind you of what other people have done. They've used antennas as the excitation to the uh, dielectric wave. Guide. So we started, uh, we needed dual polarization. So we, we looked at a dipole, half wave dipole, and, and we need to do this at two different frequencies, like I said. So this is just a cross dipole designed in HFSS in air just to confirm that, hey, we know the dimensions and we can get 75 ohm, which is a typical uh, impedance of a, a cross side pole. We did it at 315 gigahertz, and we saw that it, it works where it should be in HFSS. And then we need to now start to think about how do we combine them. So this is just a, an effort to show the sketch of the two dipole antennas. And then how do you connect them? We connected them in parallel and it, they sort of call that a spur. And then we wanted to take the longer one that's operating at the lower frequency and try to compact its size. So we bent it, as you see here. And then, you know, what I'm showing is in the blue is just one polarization. And so the red is showing the, the other polarization. So as a result of the effort to design these antennas properly, we've gone through several iterations. And so this is just showing you what those uh, designs look like. And then finally, I want to show you the student who is very uh, involved in designing the uh, new des uh, antennas. So his name is Makul Mishra. So um, we're in the process even now of measuring those antennas, uh, but my colleagues who are actually doing the transceiver work, they are, um, my mom, <laughs> the transceiver work, but they are, um, involved in, uh, I'm sorry, they, they design these antennas all the time and they go on all of their chips and we have an opportunity to measure them as well. 
But now let me just, because uh, I, I don't have a lot of time and I don't want to take up too much. Uh, the next phase of this project is really trying to build a socket, because if you go back to the original picture of showing the data uh, center, you know, we need to create something that's robust, not just an experiment in the lab that shows, hey, we can transmit and receive, but we really wanted to create a socket to support a dielectric waveguide being attached to the chip in, in a certain way. But I call to your attention uh, on the upper right, the dimensions. So I haven't talked about the dielectric waveguide, but I have some references in the back of the presentation for you to take a look at it. But it is two millimeters on a side. It's a square structure and it can support horizontal and vertical polarization. But it's big compared to the chip interface. So the chip interface uh, in the area that they've given us for the antenna is probably on the order of 250 microns. And so we need to transition from that 250 up to uh, 250 microns to 2,000 microns. And so we're doing that by using a dielectric to metallic uh, waveguide structure. So uh, once again, if you're a microwave engineer, you know that uh, rectangular waveguide is a very good uh, structure for high frequency, but a rectangular waveguide is only going to support one polarization. But if you use a square waveguide, then you can support horizontal and vertical polarization, but you also have a limitation in the frequency range of a rectangle or any type of waveguide. So you've got to figure out how do you stand the, the frequency. But this picture is some of our initial HFSS simulations of can we just do sort of like this little taper to go from the, this metallic or copper waveguide to the dielectric waveguide structure. And so what we came to realize is that no, you need a taper structure to make this work properly. So uh, what you're seeing in this slide is uh, in the upper left is a square ridge waveguide, that, well, a quad ridge square waveguide. So this waveguide has been redesigned in such a way that it will allow 100 50 gigahertz all the way to 400 gigahertz to pass. And normally a waveguide cannot do that without adding these ridges. And then the student uh, also worked on a taper to actually be able to uh, interface with a die as well as to interface with this two millimeter uh, dielectric waveguide on the other side. So this is just showing some of the images because I, I wanted him to be able to simulate this fully in HFSS. So he spent some time just estimating how do I realize this taper. Uh, so these are just showing you some of the feature sizes that, that are being proposed. Um, here, we still want a one meter um, waveguide, but in order to run the simulation in HFSS, you, you need uh, to make the, pro the pro problem smaller. So the very bottom, uh, it says you have a design geometry which is now completely symmetric and is fully parameterized in HFSS. And a master student from India did that work. He set that up for me uh, before he, he left for his, um, his job, his, once he graduated for his job. So uh, the, the overall concept that we're proposing is to be able to take these circuits that are designed by our the RFIC students and they have to be placed on boards because they have all of the additional bias circuits and uh, other components that have to be surface mount, uh, surface mount connected to the boards. But then uh, we're building this socket, as I mentioned, and we don't really show you how that socket is implemented, but the thought is that we can take those boards and make them vertical and then connect that uh, one meter uh, dielectric waveguide in a horizontal fashion. So these are just what the receiver and transmitter, this is what the board looked like a, a couple of years ago. So um, I just wanted to, to stop when, at this point and just say that we're still working. We have all of the dielectric fiber with us in my lab. We're working with uh, Dr. O to uh, complete the uh, demonstration we have to measure our antennas to make sure they're operating at the frequency that we originally designed them. And we're working with some people to design the quad ridge waveguide using 3D printing techniques. 
because it's uh, it's it's so small that it, it's too small for um, microwave work, but it's too big for IC work, and so that's why we're we're working on trying to create some prototypes using quad. Uh, I'm sorry, using 3D printing. So the last step is just to put everything together to test the transition and then to test the overall system. So I just wanted to stop here and to acknowledge those students that I mentioned, Neha Mahindrakar. Uh, she received her master's degree and now works for Teradyne. Mukul Mishra received his master's and now works for Maxim. Het uh, Trevetti received his MSEE degree and now he works for Qualcomm. So this work was supported uh, by the Semiconductor Research Corporation and uh, really and truly I have appreciated the students that have come to UT Dallas from India. We have a large contingent of students. Uh, as I mentioned to Shaban, one time I showed him a picture of all the students that are in my class and, uh, and so he was pretty uh, taken aback by the number. But um, you know, we we're fortunate to have good students who come and want to do good research and and so they, they get to publish. So as you see here, there's three publications from a PhD student who worked on the dielectric waveguide, but those two master students had an opportunity to be first author on a couple of uh, conference papers that we've presented. So this concludes my presentation. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Shunda. And uh, now we can open the floor to questions. I believe there was one question in the chat box. Uh, the question okay. was from, uh, what was the application of those filters? So I think maybe oh, it would have been, that was yes, received, so I think, quite some time back. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, I think she may have understood it by now. So yeah, they were yeah. the diplexer. And if you look at this slide, they're, they're literally supposed to create uh, a, a filter if you will, because this dielectric wave guide, it should support this entire band. Uh, but um, whether you're on the receive side and we want to break out that signal, we need a filter uh, to do that. And even on the transmit side, you come in as filtered signals and then they need to be combined. Uh, thank you. Are there any more questions? Please do unmute and you can ask your question or you can, yeah, I am seeing a few questions in the chat box. Uh, okay. One question, uh, uh, P. Nagaraju, is it possible to use reconfigurable antennas in the frequency range of 180 gigahertz and above? That's one question. That's a good question and I think that's probably something that the uh, RFIC guys might be interested in uh, considering because uh, once again, this, this design that we have right now takes up a lot of space. Um, and, and so from a reconfigurable perspective, that's if you can have, and I think you can, and if you can have switches, you need to have switches. If you could literally uh, create these banks, these filter banks, and then uh, create switches uh, for that purpose to, um, to link to those different uh, filters. So the, and, and I think that they can do those switches either maybe with diodes uh, or, or transistors. So that is potentially possible. They just have to have the control design on those uh, boards uh, to make sure they can uh, control the switches. Uh, thank you. So there's one more question from Rahul Chandra. How economical is this compared to optical fibers? So before we just proceed with this question, if anyone else has a question, please do put it up in the chat box uh, and we can go through it one by one. Yeah, the question is how okay. economical is this compared to optical fiber? How economical? Well, the, we believe that if you could mass produce this, right? If you could uh, go in and um, Say, for example, if you could fabricate this in CMOS, this is standard CMOS, so it, ideally it's lower in cost than uh, RF CMOS or uh, by CMOS processes. So the thought is that this is low in cost. The idea that we really want to implement for this socket is we really want to make this socket 
using printed circuit board techniques. And so I, I, don't, I didn't show the slide here, but there are people who are now uh, stacking different pieces of FR4 and creating holes, which is one of the thoughts that we've had to create this structure. So that in and of itself would be lower in cost. Um, but it's a matter of really trying to create this situation so that you could, we, if we make the prototype and then we send it to industry that could really uh, come up with uh, the right production technique uh, to make it lower in cost. And, and but the thing that the bottleneck, one of the bottlenecks is the dielectric waveguide itself. I didn't show it to you. I didn't talk about it. It has lower performance than an optical fiber. But the optical fiber suffers at this transition, say, from the chip to the fiber. Oops, I can't hear you, Emmanuel. Yeah, I, I believe uh, he's having some... Uh, yeah. Emmanuel, he's back, yes. Yeah, I am there. Uh, yeah, there are about uh, three or four questions. Probably with that, we can okay. end the session in the interest of time. Uh, I'll just go through the questions. Maybe you can answer them together. So where will these packages go that was designed for 320 gigahertz? I'm not sure what exactly it meant. So, yeah, okay. so... Well, and the other question okay. is, is there any possibility of radiation from dielectric waveguide? Another question, how could okay. one relate this to the possibilities of LTCC antenna packaging? The last question, okay. how to can control antenna characteristics in this? Yeah. Okay. So I liken the antenna is not as a radiator. Okay. So I don't think of it as a standard antenna. I think of it as an excitation. Just like if you had a rectangular waveguide and you were trying to go from coax to waveguide, you use sort of like a monopole almost. So that's what I call this antenna. It's more of an excitation. Uh, yes, the dielectric waveguide does, um, it, it leaks, but it's a different structure. Um, if you look at this image, so the pink is dielectric and then this purple is actually air. So it has a cladding around it. It's a, a square guide, but it's got a cladding to help confine the field. And so we get way better performance of this structure than say the plastic one that I showed at the beginning. It's more complicated to build. And we didn't use the lowest loss tangent dielectric in this structure. But uh, there is some leakage, but not very much. You also have to be concerned with how you bend it. And I didn't talk about that part. Um, Let's see, the question was about LTCC. Uh, well, LTCC, uh, I think probably now the technology is, because I've seen a couple of papers where they've done 300 gigahertz antennas on multi-layers. Here, we, we don't think we need the multi-layer part until you get to creating, how you create that socket. Do you use the multi-layers for that? But uh, perhaps LTCC could work. I think that's a possibility. Okay. I don't know if I got uh, all of them. <laughs> okay. I think there was one question on how to control antenna characteristics and the last one about dielectric materials oh. that can be used for 315 gigahertz. Okay. So uh, some of the things that the student who worked on the dielectric wave, uh, she um, did some additional research. Actually, Teflon has a lower loss tangent than the material that she used, but Teflon is it outgasses, so it, it's harder to create this kind of structure out of. We are also looking at uh, different types of glass material to make it, but then it becomes more fragile to handle. Um, so, so uh, I don't have in my uh, chart, and I think that means I need to come back and give a longer talk where I can give some more information about the dielectric uh, material because I do have it. It's just not in my, I didn't prepare any backup slides. And then in terms of the antenna performance, and I, that's also I didn't show. Um, we, uh, my, the student, Pet, before he left, he showed what the antenna radiation pattern looked like um, in, in both cases, uh, whether it was at the low frequency or the, the high frequency case. Um, and 
in terms of controlling the performance, you would just, I think, do optimization if needed on that antenna structure to make sure it still works at the right frequency and that it's it's actually exciting the, the mode the way you need it to. And, and what's important is the mode of this quad ridge waveguide. And then once that mode gets turned on, then it's going to excite this dielectric waveguide and the energy will travel through. Thank you so much, uh, Rashonda Henderson, and uh, I'm okay. sure uh, all participants had a good learning experience through this. Uh, once again, thank you so much for sparing your time and uh, educating us on these topics. So with this, the first talk is concluded, and I hand it over to Chinmay for the next yeah. session. Thank you, uh, Emmanuel, and of course, uh, thanks to Professor Rashonda. In fact, uh, I feel like it was a bit of injustice to give you just you know kind of half an hour for a technically talk enriched talk like this i hope we'll get back to you in some other events where you'll uh, get a bigger podium with uh, more time uh, thanks again yes now yeah we, so this we is go... what i think we call it a teaser right yeah <laughs> I... okay yeah, so we'll uh, go to the second part of the evening, which is a technical talk uh, by uh, Dr. Ramesh Gupta. Again, a, a very interesting one. I would request Dr. Devdeep Sarkar to take care of the proceedings in the capacity of the session chair. Dr. Sarkar. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, so thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Shah, and uh, I welcome you all. I am Devdeep from ISC Bangalore, and I would like to uh, thank especially uh, Professor Gupta and Dr. Rashunda for agreeing to uh, give delivered lecture in this IEEE and TTS Kerala chapter initiative, this L4 series. I think in my opinion is uh, proving to be really informative as well as motivating to the students who will be our uh, future engineers and uh, scientists. So. Uh, with that, I, it is my pleasure to introduce Professor uh, Ramesh Gupta, who is an esteemed speaker today. And uh, so I briefly go through the biography. Uh, Dr. Ramesh Gupta received PhD and MS degrees in electrical engineering from the University of Alberta, Canada, and BS degree with honors uh, in electronics and communication engineering from PEC University of uh, Technology, India. He also earned an MBA degree from the University of Pennsylvania. Dr. Gupta has published more than 90 journal and conference papers and three book chapters on microwave devices, passive and active RF circuits, MMIC designs, and their insertion into satellite and wireless systems. He holds four US patents. He has received many honors and awards, including Alberta a Government Telephone Centennial Fellowship for the Graduate Research in Telecommunication and ComSat Laboratories Research Award. He was co-recipient of the Best Paper Award at 1992 International Digital Satellites and Communication Conference Denmark and uh, 2011 AIA Satellite System Conference Japan. So Dr. Gupta, as we all know, has served IEEE MTTS as a voting ADCOM member since 2013. And he has been responsible for initiating several successful initiatives as IEEE MTTS Education Committee Chair. And he's currently serving as the chair of MTTS Marketing and Communication Committee. So I think it will be uh, very interesting to know from Dr. Gupta about how the satellite systems and how it's going to be so much important when we are looking into this emerging technology stuff like uh, machine to machine and the Internet of Thing applications and also the 5G system. So with that, uh, I welcome Dr. Gupta once again to the podium and we are looking forward to hearing from you. So to the participants, uh, you can put your question in the chat box. And at the end of the talk, we can uh, like take that one by one, and we can uh, continue the discussion. So the podium is open. Uh, thank you. OK, thank you. You can hear me? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. OK, OK. First of all, uh, thank you for your kind invitation. Um, uh, as I told Professor Saha, this is uh, remarkable what you're doing. It is a uh, quite phenomenal um, initiative that you have taken. So I'm very pleased to be part of it. Uh, second thing is that uh, thank you so much for your kind introduction. Um, so the the 
uh, my topic today is satellite systems for emerging telecommunications infrastructure. Um, as you know, we are going through unusual times and the telecom infrastructure has kind of saved the day for all of us. We all are adjusting to this new environment and you're having this conversation through, uh, through uh, the WebEx platform. Um, but, you know, the fact remains that the uh, telecom capacity or the need for capacity has increased about 30 to 40 percent during these times, uh, whereas the airline industry has gone down uh, in terms of uh, use by almost 60 to 70 percent and the tra traffic on the roads is down by 40 percent. So the telecom infrastructure actually has um, allowed us to stay connected uh, to be able to live our normal lives and I for the last six months I've been working from home trying to guide 20 people who report to me uh, and and uh, we have been able to do that seamlessly which is quite uh, quite remarkable uh, and the infrastructure is changing extremely fast as we all know and this particular pandemic is only make going to make it uh, uh, you know even more significant and there'll be more uh, development and growth and, and, and there are a lot of things to come here. But what I want to talk about today is the satellite systems, which are part of the telecom infrastructure. They're a very small portion if you look at the overall infrastructure, but they're a very important part. And that's what I wanted to emphasize in this particular talk. This is more of an overview talk. It will not go into details of designs as uh, uh, Roshan excellent talk did, uh, but it will give you an overview how, where the industry is going and the trends and the issues there. Uh, so my um, uh, topics, my outline is to, to look at the market drivers that are uh, responsible for this capacity growth. Uh, and then what are the um, emerging telecom networks? A perspective, you know, you have heard of 5G, IoT, and then multiple bands that are used for satellite systems. And what are the application segments and the space-based systems technology and capital cost trends and then some in conclusion. There's a lot to cover, so you'll see me touching on all these uh, uh, all these points. So <clears throat> starting from the market drivers, um, you know this this uh, let me interpret this, interpret this chart for you. The digitization of content broadband access and converged IP platforms. I mean, those are the three main drivers, but then there is a whole ecosystem that has developed around the world, including the growth of internet, which has been uh, tremendous all around the world, and then high def definition video, software, applications, global cellular coverage. And that has resulted in, as you all are very familiar with uh, your, your um, iPhones, smartphones, um, tablets, uh, laptops, and your uh, your uh, desktop computer, plus the television screen and uh, screens that exist, and uh, people have multiple of them. So when you look at the current situation, almost all of us are managing multiple platforms and screens, and and the the drive has been to be able to make that information available in all of these screens. Uh, that includes your email, your videos, your streaming, um, your voice, all of that have converged into one particular area. And that has uh, really impacted the industry um, in a huge way. Um, so the, the trend that you are very familiar with is 5G, fifth generation telecom network and IoT, which is an internet of things. And I'll give a very brief overview what that means uh, for, for both the telecom infrastructure and the satellite industry. Uh, so from the uh, Aspen Institute, uh, they, they actually created a report on for 5G, IoT, and broadband communication, and they made a statement which kind of is very, very interesting. They said broadband represents the convergence of last two great disruptive technologies. And what are those? One is the internet computing. The other one is mobile communication. Uh, these two have converged uh, to, to make a very transformative change and breakthroughs, and, and that trend will continue, uh, as you will see later. And then, 
uh, the, the other observation they made, which I wholeheartedly agree with them, is the that that uh, this will no single platform, no single technology be able to deliver everything. What we are looking for is an array of different types of technologies that will support uh, different use cases. Um, and what that really means is, if you look at the uh, diagram they left, uh, if you you know the the connectivity up to uh, 80s and 90s, early 90s, uh, before the advent of internet, it was limited to what what you can call place to place connectivity. You have a telephone exchange in one place to the other. You dial, and then somebody will go if you don't have a phone to somebody's house and say, okay, you have a phone call, and that used to cost. Uh, when I first came to Canada, two dollars and sixty cents a minute, and and as a student, I had to make a three minute call. It was almost I used to write down the points that I wanted wanted to talk to my family, uh, so that it was not too expensive. So from there, we have come to sort of the advent of internet, which started with the ARPANET um, back in seventies uh, and eighties. And uh, the ARPANET then converted itself, morphed into you know, a worldwide web, and that enabled us to have the people connectivity, uh, person to person, and uh, the advent of smartphones and, and the ability to sort of bypass the whole thing, congestion. It was really meant to avoid congestion at the exchange. That's what ARPANET was all about, but packet switching, so that in the header you can put all the information and you can uh, directly connect those packages, uh, packets back together. And you already know where the transformation has taken place and the number of devices are estimated to be uh, you know, about 20 billion. Uh, which is really most of the people have um, uh, has internet connectivity. We have more than one internet connectivity, uh, our desktop, our laptop, our a uh, couple of phones that we carry and the television and all of them are together. And the, what is the next big thing is the connectivity of things, which is really known as Internet of Things. And that's where this curve is about to take off. It is really at uh, 2020, it's already there. When I talk about 20 billion, it's there. Actually, the uh, people to people connectivity was limited below, uh, below 10 billion. It was limited to that number. When you look at the uh, picture on the right, um, that's the um, mobile data connectivity as exabytes per month. And one exabyte is equivalent to 10 to per 18 bytes, which is a billion billion, right? So right now uh, you are you're looking at this 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 trend here, uh, which is to 2020, you're at about 15 to 20 exabytes, and this is taking taking off uh, further. So so the whole telecom infrastructure is meant to address uh, this connectivity issue. So, so going farther, the fourth generation has brought us fourth fourth generation called telecom networks have brought up us up to this particular point, and you know that it was realized uh, back in. Uh, you know, last half of the decade 2014 2015 that there is a fifth. Uh, generation standard needed. So there has been a, this uh, effort you're all probably familiar with uh, of standardization, developing common standards between all the countries in the world, all the companies are involved. And that process has gone through this at least 13, 14, 15, 16, uh, which, which was released and the 5G networks are beginning to uh, be deployed. Uh, what is happening right now is the uh, the so-called uh, NTN, that's non-trustial network, integration of those into the trustial network. So most of the standards have been developed for trustial systems led by big telecom companies. Uh, and the, the um, non-trustial network includes uh, high altitude platforms, uh, balloons that can be in a, in a local place, low orbit uh, satellites, LEOs, uh, medium orbit satellites, MEOs, uh, and then um, uh, geosynchronous uh, satellites, which are geos. So those standards are currently actually, we are participating as a company into that particular process uh, to try to come to an agreement on those standardization processes. But the key promise of the 5G technology is to be able to connect anything, anytime, 
to anyone, any place, any service and any network. And that is to be done with the low latency, which means this is a big mouthful, but I think the point I want to bring about is when we talk about anyone, any place, uh, the world is a diverse place. You cannot have towers in the middle of the ocean. You can't have them on top of mountains. You just don't have the visibility between those towers and the cost is prohibitive. So what we see going forward is uh, the, um, so the convergence of the, the different technologies coming together to be able to fulfill that uh, promise that uh, uh, 5G technology is supposed to have. And, and what is that particular promise? It is uh, of autonomous and connective automotives, uh, which, which the trend is already there, and uh, connected cities, which means traffic, parking, bus, shelter, bus shelters, and any um, any vehicles management of uh, uh, even even um, taxis and and uh, vehicles that will transport transport vehicles buses uh, you know how how to make manage them so that congestion can be minimized uh, connected health which is going to be a big uh, area just imagine uh, we all have our parents some of them are getting old and we uh, want we worry about them just imagine that they wear the wearable uh, sensors, and then you are able to get a report on a daily basis what their blood pressure is, what their sugar level is, and how they're doing, and uh, all of that comes to you uh, as an alert if there's anything is going off, so that you can uh, immediately, uh, you know, give attention to to those kinds of situations. Similarly, the utilities, smart meters, uh, fleets uh, of uh, uh, not only cars, uh, trucks, uh, buses, um, and and uh, even cruise liners or ships, um, and then the safety, surveillance, or uh, mission control smart vehicles. So all this is a promise of fifth generation technology, and this is just at the onset. It's just beginning. The technology beginning to be launched. So ten years from now, you'll see uh, many of these uh, uh, systems coming to fruition. And as that happens, uh, you know, I want to switch now to the satellites, what role they have to play. Uh, so satellites, those of you who are not familiar, uh, they come in different colors and flavors in, in terms of their application, in terms of the bands they are using, and, and some of the future band, uh, starting from L band, which is 1.5 to 1.6 gigahertz, that's used for mobile satellite communication, same is the case with S band in India, for example, it is the S band that's used for mobile communication. And then there is a digital audio uh, services, uh, like uh, Sirius uh, satellite or XM radio, uh, those are uh, audio broadcast to, to mobile vehicles. C band and KU band have been the mainstay of commercial satellite um, connectivity between regions and countries. Um, so when I first started my job at Comsat in uh, 1980s, uh, that's where the play was, and we were actually we were the first ones at that time to demonstrate the potential of KA band um, by what is what is called uh, ACTS satellite. It was a NASA project for advanced communication technology satellite uh, to demonstrate that the KA band can get uh, traffic uh, connectivity up to 600 megabit per second, which was at that time fiber was coming as a competitive um, uh, threat. So the issue was that there is a role for satellites. And now there are Q and uh, V bands, which are from 30 to 50 gigahertz range. Um, and and in, in, in satellite, those of you who are familiar with it, as you go lower in frequency, you have less of um, propagation issues. As you go higher in frequency, rain fades and other uh, atmospheric effects, they come to bite you. But then the um, bandwidth available at higher bands is much larger. So it's a issue of how do you design systems that can fulfill the data rate needs that uh, different applications have. So here I show the those data application new needs, you know, Bluetooth, you know, cellular and packet data to two and two and a half uh, uh, G networks, which are up to one mega, uh, one megabits per second. And then there are three and four G and this is about below 10 and actually our uh, Wi-Fi networks 
are able to provide us much higher speeds. And then as we go through this particular process, it comes 5G, and which is really what I'm putting here as a uh, as a opportunity opportunity for convergence between two technologies. But then you go into millimeter waves and free space optics and gigabit fiber. So that's the terrestrial world. And on the satellite side, you have the mobile satellite services, uh, direct audio broadcasts, direct broadcast services, direct to home television streaming, and then we have the connectivity with C and KU band, and then we get into the KA and V bands, which are really very uh, capable of delivering the speeds that we get through um, through optical fibers. Uh, and, and it's not for every location, but it can be selective. So that's where the opportunity comes for these two areas to uh, uh, converge together, and that's what is happening right now uh, in the industry. So, um, traditionally, when you look at the satellite designs, um, the uh, but one more thing I want to just mention very quickly, that is the local and wide area. That's where the terrestrial network come to play. When it comes to regional and global connectivity, then you have the ability to use the satellite. So, so when we talk about application segments for service segments for satellites uh, from the lower band up to higher band, uh, you, 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 you see the, uh, it's mostly in the lower data range. It's in kilobits, 384 uh, kilobits per second connectivity to handheld devices. Uh, that can connect directly with the satellite. And then we get into the so-called VSATs and uh, C-band and KU-band DBS direct broadcast uh, services, and this is direct to home, and then some connectivity to cruise liners, and it started on even on the airlines. But now we go to KA-band, KA-band gives you connectivity to uh, to the uh, planes, um, uh, the flying objects, and and the advantage there is because these flying, uh, the the airplanes they fly above the clouds. Many of the propagation effects uh, are not critical. So so you can imagine a future where a plane ride, uh, not only it is it is reducing in time. Um, you know, you will have full connectivity, so you can uh, literally have an office in your plane and have your uh, have your laptop um, or a mobile device to be able to connect, uh, like we do on ground. Um, so when we look at the geosynchronous side, which is the most popular, has been most popular uh, orbit where the satellite goes around the Earth uh, in the same, almost same duration as the Earth itself. So which means it stays, it uh, looks stationary from ground. The arc, geostationary arc is getting full with uh, lots of satellites in place uh, around the globe. Uh, started with, you know, when I first started at uh, ComSat, um, it was a very limited set of satellites which are launched by Intelsat, which was the only organization that could provide international services. That has changed dramatically over the years. Um, now every country has domestic satellites to to provide geo um, uh, connectivity. So, but but the technology uh, to enable these satellites have changed tremendously. Um, the first satellite that was launched for commercial purposes. Uh, had only 240 simultaneous telephone circuits that you could connect the globe. And those are three satellites that were uh, meant to do that. Uh, that kind of connectivity, you, ha you have that in, in palm of your hand right now. But to get to the um, systems that we have today, we have narrow beams with higher uh, power, uh, which is uh, effective isolated radiative power which is the term used with by, by the time you add antenna gain to it. And then multi-band payloads, the bands I showed you, um, the beam coverage flexibility um, and ability to um, allocate power, RF power to different beams, depending on the traffic and beam to beam connectivity, which is required as you uh, connect two spots from one place to the other, uh, frequency allocations and uh, flexibility, which you do from ground, interference mitigation uh, as the interference environment is getting uh, worse, and then the design life. Uh, the first satellite was la uh, launched with one year design life, and then 
it lasted much longer. And then the first satellites I was involved with in designing were seven years lifetime and going to 10, which was a big leap. And now uh, routinely satellites are designed, geosynchronous satellites are designed with 15 to 18 years life. And uh, I'm personally man managing some satellites which were launched 25 years ago. So they're still in operation, uh, but the LEO satellites are uh, being designed between one to five years time frame. Um, so these cycles for procurement are getting shorter and hosted payload means you can literally put your own payload on somebody else's satellite. And rather than launching a satellite, you can have part of a satellite. So this is this is a kind of trend, but what it has done, it is dramatic. So this is in 1960s, in mid 60s, um, um, the, this is a, this is the first satellite that was that was launched, and uh, Rosen he was a uh, Harold Rosen uh, pioneer in the at uh, Boeing who made this at uh, that time it was called Hughes Aircraft Company and you see him in this particular picture you can literally take this particular satellite and hold in your hand uh, as you can see here the antennas on ground that were used to communicate with those satellites were 30 meters in diameter. 30 meters, imagine that, uh, a lot of metal. And because the link was such that uh, there was more, lot more power and gain on the ground, a lot less on the satellite. And as time has gone by, uh, the, the earth station, those are very, very expensive earth stations, they got reduced in size so that there's a distributed communication uh, architecture rather than having few one per country or two per country it went to multiple uh, this is like a 2.8 meter antenna and then coming to vsats which were um, uh, less than one meter 1 1.2 meters at c band and and then going to handhelds now the satellites are um, have the larger antenna, so the complexity is put on the satellite. Actually, the satellite, one of the satellites I operate, has a 22 meter reflector on the satellite. So it, it is just inversion of the link equation. Uh, we, we have put complexity in a single node on the satellite rather than on the ground because we want to reduce the cost of the ground equipment. And the other part is the modulation schemes. Uh, they are going into advanced modulation schemes simply because you want to able, want to have good quality of service as you do that. But but this transition has taken place over time, um, and you know I've been very fortunate to be involved with this whole process. Uh, during my career, that's what makes it. That's what makes it very exciting. That this curve, a cost curve on the ground, has come down, and the power capacity, which is measured in the form of uh, aggregate effective isolated radiated power, which is really the total power that satellite can deliver. Now we can allocate that into different parts, different uh, areas, depending on the traffic capacity, um, and the other key feature of these satellites is that the amount of DC power that you can generate on the uh, in space uh, from being uh, less than kilowatt now is uh, in the typically 10, 15 to 25 kilowatt uh, range. And that actually provides us this ability to connect uh, and make the satellites a lot more complex. And uh, this is just a picture that I wanted to show you. Viasat 3, this is not launched yet. So this is a system of three satellites which will provide one terabyte capacity around the world, around the globe. And what you see here in this pattern are the beams. And those beams are formed using phase array antennas, um, which are we are all familiar with. And, and the way this is designed to, to maximize the uh, traffic capacity on the landmass where people are and then have wider beams uh, on the other areas. So though that's the geosynchronous satellite. And now you hear this term new space, uh, which really means there are a number of low earth orbit or medium earth orbit satellites which are being designed and implemented. It will be the, the, some of these will be available in next three to five years, assuming that some of these companies can fund them. One Bab, as you know, it has 650 satellites. It uh, did file for bankruptcy. It is coming out of bankruptcy at the end of the year, and hopefully they'll be able to complete their system. Uh, Telesat has about 1,248 satellites, which is a system 
still in development. And uh, one of the most talked about and exciting system that is being put together is by Elon Musk from uh, SpaceX on Starlink. And he's trying to put 12,000 satellites around the globe. Um, and then uh, to, to just uh, not, not to be left behind, Amazon has proposed a, what they call Cooper system with the 3,236 satellites, which will be um, uh, orbiting. Some of these systems are, um, you know, they, they cost a lot of money, uh, billions of dollars. But when you look at SpaceX and Amazon, they have the capacity to spend that kind of money. And that's why they will uh, come into fruition. Uh, the other part is that uh, SpaceX and Amazon are also uh, players in the launch side of the uh, industry. And so they, they control both the launching as a business Plus, they are going into the satellite internet, all for the promise of 5, 5G, for fifth generation integration into the systems. And then SES has a medium uh, Earth orbit satellite system. And, and the, the difference between a geo system and these systems is the, the satellite rises and sets off like, like a sun and moon, uh, but the, the cycle of rotation is uh, one and a half, two hours around the Earth. So you have to keep track of those satellites and makes it puts the complexity back on the ground. So the whole concept of doing that, the, which is um, which has been used, is the use of phase array multi beam coverage, uh, which means the beams are designed as small cells, and then each of these cells then have a separate allocation of frequency. So you divide up the bandwidth into, in this case, just for illustration purposes, four segments, and then you make them so that these beams with the same color, they get isolated from each other. Um, in this case, uh, this is an example of 32 beams with the uh, reuse cluster of eight and for frequency factor, reuse factor is four, and that gives you a spectral efficiency of eight times, meaning you can, you can limited bandwidth can be deployed eight times. Um, um, so, but, but the reality is that when you put this together, every beam working at the same uh, frequency, it does create interference into the into the other system. Okay, so you 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 have to take care of that. So this is just an illustration, but the satellites are now being designed. Uh, this is in fact with the, this illustration with 32 beams, but if you make them 100 with four, it'll be 25 times. If you make 1,000, it'll be 250 times. So you, you literally are uh, using the same bandwidth and trying to reallocate and trying to increase capacity. That's how you get there. Um, now, just going to a little bit of um, um, engineering behind it, you know, the, the um, high power amplifier, which is the power of the transmitted power from the HPA on board the satellite. And then there is there are, um, uh, Diplexers, literally for transmit and receive, separating those signals from each other, and and that is a lossy uh, loss, which is uh, which can add substantially to that particular power. So basically, you are generating power, which is by in itself inefficient, depending on the uh, efficiency of the power amplifiers, and you have a loss. But then the benefit is the antenna gain. Uh, antenna gain for narrow beams it increases as the beam becomes uh, narrow and narrower. So the ERP for a particular beam is really a sum of all this, which is positive, negative, and positive. Um, now, that's what gives you the higher, uh, what we call ERP in short, but then the noise component of it now must consist of the thermal noise and the co-channel interference, which becomes substantial as you put these beams together, adjacent, uh, channel interference and intermodulation products; those all become look like uh, interference at the at the end. So, if you look at the Shannon the capacity theorem, uh, you know that defines the maximum capacity as a log function, uh, which is a signal to noise ratio, and signal to noise ratio is really related to uh, carrier to noise ratio in this particular case, um, and then divided by bandwidth. And this particular equation, uh, which I devised in 1948 from MIT still holds, but the B factor, which is the usable bandwidth, that is a function of the reuse factor, which I talked about. And that's how the capacity is increasing with a, uh, with a function of time. Now, with the, as, as new systems are coming. Um, 
The other part is the DC power that uh, is there on the on the satellite. You basically have solar arrays that convert the solar energy to a DC power. And uh, so there is a efficiency there. And so they get heated up. You have to get rid of the heat in space. Uh, in addition to that, that particular DC power, the, the DC power coming in, um, it is used for the payload, which consists of the receivers, the converters, and TTNC systems, and uh, housekeeping functions on board the satellite, which is called the bus, and then the high power amplifiers. Um, uh, what what strikes you is that the high power amplifiers themselves they use about eighty to ninety percent of the power that is produced, and and though their efficiency matters because whatever is not being converted into RF is being generated as a heat. And then you have to dissipate that, remove that, and becomes a huge thermal problem. So, so the net net of all that is there is small RF power that goes into the high power amplifiers. And then, uh, you know, there's HP efficiency by which, uh, you know, you, you can convert the power into and then amplification that gets you to to the uh, transmitted power and then we have the in in uh, input back off to be able to minimize the nonlinearities output back off and noise and spurs and intermods and that's the main uh, sort of contributes to useful radiated rf power which is which is much smaller than the um, the total power, and that creates a thermal and um, dissipation management problem. Um, so it is the it is the RF power that we are interested in as users because that is what is transmitted to the ground, and that is what reduces the size of the Earth station on ground. Uh, so between frequency reuse and uh, RF power, it becomes extremely critical. And why is that relevant to us? The the typical TWTA characteristics they saturate. Um, beyond a certain point, and uh, for maximum efficiency, we have to operate at these levels. Um, but when we operate at these levels, the um, there is a compression in amplitude, and there is a uh, variation in phase. So the linearization technique, speed distortion linearization, those um, reduce the. AM to AM, AM distortion and the phase which is plotted on the right that can be handled by uh, you know flattening the phase curve and that's because the modulation schemes are um, heavily dependent on the amplitude and phase of the of the system um, so there is there is a um, uh, Professor uh, Dr. Alan Katz uh, good friend of ours uh, he has this linearization technology he has a um, White paper on his site, uh, which which basically describes all about linearization. So I won't go into detail. What I want to go to is that uh, the modulation schemes, uh, you know, the BPSK, uh, which is really uh, 180 degrees apart, that kind of uh, of uh, modulation is used for telemetry and for deep space probes because that's not very efficient. You get two bits. Uh, Per second per hertz, and then there are eight, uh, four PSK. No, then th that's not even two. That's QPSK. It's only half actually in in BPSK. So it's um, uh, you know, two, and then you go up to four, sixteen quam, sixty four quam, higher order uh, of uh, modulation schemes, and for a seventy two megahertz uh, transponder, this kind of tells you how do you get to the capacity. Uh, that you need. So the part of the loss is because you have to separate the frequencies uh, because of um, uh, adjacent channel interference, and um, and you have to operate near the QPSK. Operation is near the power uh, efficient point in the in the SSPA. And uh, one way to do that is to use adaptive modulation schemes, which means uh, depending on the channel. Uh, performance, uh, uh, the carrier to noise, uh, you know, there are other factors like the propagation delays and propagation um, fades. So you can then switch back and forth to different modulation schemes and and uh, use the satellite to maximize the capacity. Uh, so, so, so given all that, 
um uh, dr gupta sorry to interrupt uh, actually i uh, was uh, like trying to say to you that uh, i think we have uh, like little running short of time so maybe okay. we can five five to ten minutes five minutes yeah then no no we have just yeah. only two slides so I, i'll yeah. be fine yeah okay yeah. okay okay thank you yeah so the two two you know the present capacity uh, using satellites is two terabytes and in 10 years we are expecting it to go to uh, about 15 to 20 terabytes and um, with the leo systems which are already proposed we may have uh, 40 60 percent of the capacity uh, assuming that they they really get launched and they they become operational uh, coming from those systems and uh, remaining will be the geo stationary uh, orbit satellites um, and uh, the global data consumption as i told before it exabytes it is increasing uh, 100 times per decade so this capacity this bubble is going to keep on increasing which means this has to keep up with it and that's where the 5g 5g and iot scenarios are the other thing i just wanted to point out is that uh, over time because of this technology change the um, um, when you look at the cost and capacity, capacity has gone up 500 times uh, over this this time, whereas the cost per uh, gigabit has come down 400 times. So you have uh, you, know, you can multiply these uh, two numbers, uh, 200 th 100 times uh, improvement in the um, in the dollar per gigabit. Uh, cost of running these and this, this this is significant because that that's where these uh, satellite system compare with the trustal side, uh, side in the end a business has to make profit and and the cost becomes extremely important so uh, what we are saying is that the in summary and conclusion that the space based networks are moving towards um, integrated conver uh, converged high capacity networks and that's where 5g and iot comes into play we are moving towards higher band ka and b bands in addition to the traditional lc and ku bands uh, leo mio constellations are getting added to geo satellite systems narrow beams i talked about with frequency use result in smaller terminals and multiple reflector and multi-region coverages for high throughput satellites high power and high gain uh, high efficiency SSPAs, uh, that's the need of the day uh, for all these bands, uh, frequency converters, compact and agile, and then the onboard channelization, switching, routing, which is uh, digital sig signal processing base, and then beam forming and on-demand reallocation of power and bandwidth resources, depending on the traffic, um, interference mitigation and cancellation techniques, and tunable temperature compensated filters multiplexers those are the ones used at the output of the antenna to to uh, to separate the transmit and receive so those are some of the technology trends and and you know if you look at it many of them have direct impact on the rf and microwave technology and also on packaging as uh, rashanda went through she she addressed the question for a specific frequency band but the problem is equally challenging at all bands because you have to remove heat you have to get it as small as possible and and that's how the whole rf and micro technology is contributing to these huge systems that are coming up over 10 years uh, that concludes my talk thank you so much for listening uh thank you dr gupta for this excellent informative presentation and uh, i think uh, we i dr shah will also agree that maybe we would uh, in future have a like larger um, podium and longer time uh, to hear more from you because today for the time constraints i think we had to cut the talk a little bit short so i'll um, take a, a few can questions I question? can i can i ask a question yeah yeah sure uh, thank you very much uh, dr Mish Gupta. it was an excellent talk for the futuristic that uh, look, for the future if, uh, effective satellite systems that we're going to have in space. But uh, what about the space debris that everybody is concerned about? Yeah, that's a, that's a very, very good question, very relevant question. And there's a lot of concern about the space debris issue, uh, particularly when, uh, you know, we have um, thousands of the satellites in LEO orbit. Um, as they are getting introduced, when new systems are introduced, um, 
uh, and and you, you know one of the one of the questions is uh, you know measured in the form of debris flux um, there have been at least two incidents uh, recently uh, where there have been uh, collisions in in space one was a iridium satellite that collided into a russian satellite and created a lot of additional debris and then there was a intelsat galaxy satellite that uh, lost intelsat lost control and it uh, literally had a fuel leak and it exploded and that created a lot of lot of debris so so this is a uh, you know this is a issue which even uh, fcc in us they have the so called a paper out for rule making uh, they want to put the burden back on the operators they have to demonstrate how they will manage that debris and uh, believe it or not there are uh, systems coming up to be able to remove the debris uh, from the space um, so so it it is it is a concern it is an issue uh, which is uh, being addressed right so thank you very much because iridium really didn't you know, go off it was i believe the success wasn't that great yeah so uh, i think we can yeah take a few uh, questions uh, from the audience so what i'm seeing in the chat box i am trying to summarize for the sake of uh, the time interest so rahul asks that how can we uh, have a transmit antenna i am not sure that is related to uh, this talk but uh, there are questions like which kind of modulation techniques are uh, used in uh, satellite communication so uh, okay yeah. yeah so so the the most popular modulation technique is uh, qpsk that's what has been the mainstay uh, which is very very reliable uh, the the four phase uh, psk but um, you know the new systems are getting designed with the uh, uh, higher modulation schemes including including 16 qam and uh, 64 qam uh, the idea there is if you have a clear channel if you are flying above the clouds and there is a clear, clear line of view and that there is a, a sufficient signal to noise ratio that uh, you can really uh, transmit at a much much higher speeds with the uh, coding and other techniques so so uh, the satellite systems are using a flexible uh, modulation schemes. They have all of them built into a chip so that uh, it senses the noise level and from there selects the uh, the scheme that uh, that gives the maximum throughput. Hmm. Okay. 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 Thanks. Thanks for the answer. And another question is uh, with the increasing demands of uh, frequency in satellite communication, it also leads to high uh, power requirement for the ground station. So how to deal with this problem? Yeah, so so um, there, there are two aspects. Is, but one is that with the uh, narrower focus beams, the that helps in in reducing the size of the ground station. Uh, there, there are two two pieces to it. One is a ground station which is to be treated as a user terminal or there is a ground station that directly communicates with the satellite. Once a ground station directly communicates with the satellite and if it can be high capacity, then you can provide, you can supply signal to terrestrial networks. Uh, but you know, for remote places, you need to provide direct connectivity between the satellite and the ground. Uh, so there are the narrow beams uh, of the order of uh, uh, two tenths of a degree um, or, or even less are used to to reduce the amount of power you transmit from the satellite and also you know it's to close the link basically you need a small not that large a ground station mm -hmm. yeah okay uh one more question is uh, what are the latency issues of nt and compared to fiber net backhaul and how that can be improved so do you think this is related to the you can yeah it is it is it is very much relevant. the whole, the whole yeah. late, latency is a big issue in the 5g networks because you know once you envision automation and you are directly depending on the signal you want to minimize the latency even on the trustial systems and uh, the numbers um, you know with the satellite typically in geosynchronous satellite there is a delay uh, 250 milliseconds one way so it's about 550 500 to 550 milliseconds back and forth which was uh, okay for 
voice but you know for the uh, you know there's a there's a concern about uh, you know using that for real time control systems uh so uh the answer is that most of the geo systems still make a lot of sense for uh broadcast over large areas or unicast where the uh, signal is being transmitted one way down where the delay really data doesn't care about the delay as long as it is getting there and, and there is a processing delay uh, yeah. in the in the telecom systems which really sometimes can be as much as 20 30 milliseconds so um, uh, you know the leo systems are being designed with that 10 to 20 millisecond delay okay okay latency okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this uh, so much to know and learn. So uh, I think, yeah, uh, one more question is mostly related to the space junk aspect. And I think Dr. Siddiqui already asked that part and you also answered that. So I'm not. Uh, OK, so I think we have a request from uh, Dr. Raghavan. So uh, yeah, I would like to uh, request Dr. Raghavan since he's here to unmute him and just ask uh, maybe in one minute uh, something and then we can uh, move over to the next part of our uh, event. Yeah. So, Dr. Raghavan, uh, if you are there. Uh, uh, respected Professor. Uh, uh, yes, you, good evening, Professor Raghavan. Please go ahead. Uh, sir, you arranged one uh, special session on education in the IEEE conference in Bangalore. You, uh, then um, um, Dr. Kaul, and I, I also gave a topic on the microwave made simple. Then you uh, wanted me to send all the materials to you you have put in the micro magazine also a part of it i hope you can remember i am yes i do i do i do uh professor Ragman, you know oh. maybe what we should do the next part of the discussion we have uh, you will see the outcome of all that discussion we had i believe it was in bangalore uh, yes sir. yes sir. very happy yes, that uh, you are yeah. still remembering <laughs> absolutely absolutely not yeah. only we, we are remembering we have taken action and you will see that in the next part of the uh, conversation panel session oh, thank you thank you sir thank you very much sir thank you thank you yeah so i think with that we are uh, at the end of our uh, like technical talk and then i will hand uh, the podium over to professor shah to ca carry on the event and once again thank dr gupta for giving us such a nice presentation thank you thank you uh, dr sarkar thank for a nice oration and of course uh, to the speaker uh, dr uh, gupta i believe uh, even though you thought uh, your talk won't be uh, going too much uh, you know penetrating too much of the technicality but i believe uh, you know when you have a heterogeneous audience this is better that you cover a 360 view of uh, the entire I know satellite antennas and then space communications and also during q a you covered many other things i believe uh, this was a very useful talk because you know you have a more coverage i think in terms of azimuthal coverage probably you covered the entire 360 degree of the space systems and probably in the next opportunity you will have a you know different kind of podium where you can have more time and you can go in a certain you know focused manner with a high high gain uh, type of talk like more focused beam right yeah th th yeah th th thank you i think uh because it's a student chapter i thought yeah. uh, keep it at a high level so that pe people can understand the overall picture rather than going into yeah. a specific yeah. technology uh yeah. because there are a lot of drivers as you know these are systems which need which require uh, consideration of what technology is available um and what can be adopted and what cannot be adopted uh be, at the end of the day we have to deliver a system that that works right and manage yeah. it so yeah yeah so that, that's it like you know uh, these l for talks you people have uh, spent so much of time in your uh, career in your education and you have almost gone through all possible corners to east and bend so you have the experience in all fronts to guide and to you know monitor the next generation the youngsters so that's why we we planned and we conceived this kind of event so i think we are in right direction with all your blessings and uh, advice from the societies and all so with this yeah, yeah. We... I, I hope i hope you know one of the uh, messages to young students who are you know undergraduates and graduate students um, there is just so much opportunity out there. There are just so many engineering challenges to be able to uh, implement these systems. Uh, it is just not possible for 
one person to do that. It is it is it requires a whole group of dedicated, uh, uh, you know, smart engineers to be able to solve individual problems, and then bring them back to the system. So, uh, you know, uh, it is time of pandemic. We always feel uh, if we feel discouraged, don't because this pandemic will go away, but these systems are still going to be around and still this is exciting world out there. Yeah, yeah. So thank you very much. Thank uh, to you for excellent talk. So before we move to the next session, as I uh, mentioned during the agenda, now we'll have a virtual photo session. So all of you are requested, the entire uh, participants are requested to turn on your video and our volunteers will uh, take, capture the screen. We have kept five minutes for this, and I believe we can save some uh, minutes on this. Sivada and Gopika, done? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. So you can see the agenda. We are uh, lagging a little bit, but we'll uh, try to cover it up in the next session. And so welcome to this uh, exciting panel discussion on MTTS role in expansion of educational and resource activities. I'll be monitoring, I'll be basically, you know, taking care of this session with uh, Dr. Rashinda Anderson and Dr. Ramesh Gupta. Both of them are leaders. I mean, one is the chairman of uh, Education Committee of MTT Society and there is chairperson of uh, Marcom. So you can understand this is a very panel and I'll be doing the moderation. So this uh, particular panel discussion, before we open uh, to the audience, we'll have uh, 10 minutes to each of the speakers, first with Dr. Rasunda Anderson, and then with Dr. Ramesh Gupta. Then we'll uh, open up the panel discussions uh, for the benefits of the students and the researchers across the the globe and as you know because it's being uh, recorded and archived so this can be used uh, in future as a resource uh, material and as uh, dr gupta was mentioning yesterday during our uh, trial run that he is going to take initiative to uh, archive all these uh, materials in the mtts website so with this uh, we start the panel uh, first over to dr rashinda anderson for your uh, Initial remark, probably you will be uh, talking on the educational initiatives of the entity society and then we'll to Dr. Gupta. So over to you, Professor Anderson. I'm not going to talk for 10 minutes. I'm going to keep it shorter so we can have more panel. Uh, but I just, the first slide is just talking about the, the membership of the education committee. I'm the chair, Ramesh is the past chair. So you actually have double the value in the room, uh, so to speak. And so Shaban Cool, who you heard from earlier, is the vice chair and also Gautam uh, Chattopadhyay, he is also a vice chair. So all of the people that you know very well are involved in the education committee. And so I think that that speaks a lot for uh, what's going on in India and the opportunities that exist. So we have the, the uh, committee broken up right now into 
four different areas, student activities, webinars, and then a special interest group on uh, microwave and wireless education. And then the last one is uh, talking about uh, review articles. So let me go to my next slide. Okay, so I'm just gonna briefly go through this. Uh, actually on October 15th was the deadline for the graduate fellowships uh, submissions. And uh, I talked to them today and they said they had over 37 applications for the graduate fellowship. So that is awarded to students. Uh, they write a uh, submit an application with a mentor and they get $6,000 uh, that can be applied towards their research and then the travel grant to come to uh, our conference uh, IMS. And so I'm showing you a photo of the uh, at, uh, fellowship uh, who, who manages that program. Then not only are there just what we call a general category, but there's a medical applications area for graduate students, very same type of program, and there are two colleagues who manage that. So I'm trying to share with students that they're not aware of the opportunities that, they, that exist for receiving funds uh, of support from uh, MTTS. And then uh, there's an undergraduate, pre-graduate scholarship program which has two submission deadlines. One is April 5th and the 15th, I'm sorry. And the other is October 15th. And that one, we may extend the deadline. And if we do, we'll send out an email and try to uh, reach out to professors. Uh, at the, at, and that one uh, is a scholarship for $1,500 and travel grant to either attend IMS or a regional conference. As has been mentioned briefly, the special intergroup excuse me, special, special interest group on microwave and wireless uh, systems uh, in education has been uh, really driven through Professor Cool. And so what you see here are photographs of these uh, kits, the RF kits that he's been able to uh, deliver and deploy in India, Sri Lanka, Peru, and Mexico. Uh, so some of you are probably on the call. Some of you are um, students who may know these uh, professors. And so you hopefully are getting an opportunity in the future when we go back to campus to use these systems. And, and so this is just uh, a photo of what they look like, what's included, which gives students a, a great opportunity to measure different uh, components and learn how they operate. And so I know that when we send students from our university to industry, they are so excited that they have laboratory experience. So we know that this helps. Uh, activities that the Education Committee provides uh, really happen at our flagship conference, the International Microwave Symposium. And so I'm just going to go through this really quickly, but we have a student paper competition, and that's for people whose papers get accepted to the conference students, student design competitions, Students can work with uh, companies like Agilent, or, I'm sorry, Keysight and Rode Schwartz to design circuits and then have them measured at the conference. A graduate student challenge, a PhD student sponsorship initiative, and then we do some outreach with high school students. I just wanted to show you this picture. These are some students of mine when uh, IMS, uh, I think, was in in Boston. And so this in the background is, is the exhibit floor and students have an opportunity really to meet uh, people who work in the industry and, and talk about the, the different sy software systems that they may use, uh, in EM simulation tools and those measurement tools. So the PhD student sponsorship initiative is uh, right now at IMS, but there's a part of that has been happening at IMARC as well. And it's typically for first and second year PhD students. And then that grad student challenge has also been implemented in some form at uh, IMARC to try to encourage students from different universities to come together and form new ideas on topics. Uh, the student design competition, as I mentioned, um, and the reason I'm showing this is because students get an opportunity to write an article and publish it in Mark Webb magazine. So uh, these are things that, A, we can start to think about as an opportunity at IMARC, but also you all can see that there are things not just, you know, attending that conference, but ways you can expand your influence really to IMS. Uh, let me see. And then uh, this is a 3MT. This is a three-minute thesis. Uh, 
program that happens at the IMS where students have to take their complex ideas and try to explain them very simply to um, an audience of non-engineers. And so they, are, they get awards for that. And then of course, our webinar series. And so um, I really had the opportunity to meet Chen Moy at the beginning of the year and interact with him as he presented a webinar on his work. And with attending the webinar, you get PDH credit. So that's credit, whether you're in industry, uh, but it's credit that can be applied for you in terms of con continuing education. We have a, uh, this is also in line, I think with what Ramesh was talking about, an MTT satellite challenge that students can participate worldwide. Uh, so we're in the second round of that, but students get financial support to try to develop CubeSats and other uh, technology for satellite deployment. And then this is my last slide, the regions. So I'm, I'm done, so I'll stop. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, so, you know, industry, academia, mm -hmm. and research. So research, you know, is something in between both academia and industry. So we have representation right. from both the fronts. And also we yeah. have representation as far as the another tagline of MTTS and IEEE is concerned, which is Omen in Microwave. So from that aspect also, we have 50% of uh, uh -oh. <laughs> young male and female representation. So I would now request uh, Dr. Gupta to have initial remarks on the uh, marketing aspect as well as the industry aspects, research opportunities, and then we'll go for the open session. Over to you, Dr. Gupta. Thank you, thank you, Professor Saha. First of all, uh, thank you, uh, Roshanda. Um, she um, is uh, leading the education committee uh, very well, and uh, this was, you know, uh, I, I was doing it for quite some time. I was looking for the right person to take it over, and I. I think I found the right one, and she is just doing tremendous job um, carrying carrying the programs forward. Uh, what I want to talk about is the uh, what else we are doing uh, beyond what uh, um, Dr. Henderson talked about. Uh, these are some new initiatives. Um, so the marketing and communication committee was established only two years ago, and our purpose was to uh, you know put more emphasis on digital presence. Uh, of the content that we have and make it available uh, free of cost to the members, uh, including student members. And then we have a nominal charge for uh, others, but it, it grew into something much bigger than that. Um, so we do, I do manage uh, the publications. We are trying to make connections with the industry so that they can uh, put advertisements in our magazine and uh, webinars. I coordinate with the education committee. Um, we got sponsorship for some of those, the booths at the uh, at uh, different conferences, including IMS, uh, support the uh, uh, the MGA, the membership committee in in creating a booth uh, and creating some some common uh, branding uh, of that and and newsletter with our. Uh, information society but you know what what we have several initiatives but you know the ones in red those were added this year simply because we had covid-19 so we had the virtual ims which was free to members um we uh, had a virtual booth there uh, we are doing the source center i'll talk about that and then uh, there are other things the dml lectures since uh, they cannot travel now are being done virtually as part of the webinar series so see so the idea was to bring all of that into a common platform why is that necessary if you look at science and engineering the national science foundation looked at uh, it is a big report on uh, 2020 report on the basic uh, science science and engineering and what you find is that um, between 2010 and they have data up to 2018, the U.S., which is in red, is, is still one of the large, larger contributors. And then next is the European Union, uh, which is really, um, you know, as a percentage, uh, contributing uh, 24%, I believe, in, in this particular case. Uh, and then what you see is uh, China has made tremendous strides in being um, 
at uh, 21 percent and then next is these are the top few countries uh, we have india in this color here and really gone you know double tripled from what we were at 2010 but on the scale where um, where the contribution can be made given the size and scale of the country you know there is some room to go there and that's really the comment i made last time uh, that we have India has a lot of potential and and uh, that has to grow um, and that was the point Dr. Ogben made in that uh, uh, education forum that I had. So when you look at the scientific um, articles and articles is not necessarily papers, these are in all areas of science, not micro and techniques, even then we see they say China uh, with the individual authors and collaborations. This is United States at the second place, United Kingdom, Germany, and then, then comes India. And we can be proud of the fact that we are at fifth level, but when you look at the disparity, I think there's, there's a lot of room to grow there. And I think you're doing the right thing in promoting, uh, promoting these uh, activities that will generate interest. So given that, uh, we took initiative to build what we call digital capacity in micro MTT uh, society education and research. And, and the idea here is to, um, to, to connect and archive the content which is already existing in terms of initiatives with webinars, tutorials, or short courses, distinguish micro lectures. We can capture that and, and keep it together and, and make it available. And then the, there is the IMS and regional conferences, their workshops, technical lectures, micro apps, and 3MT, Roshanda mentioned. Uh, we can archive that as well. And then there is an open source micro journal, which we launched in January. And open source means it is reviewed journal, but it doesn't, um, it, it is made available free of charge to everybody. Um, and the cost is borne by the authors rather, rather than MTT. So there, there, are, there are some, some quirks, but there, there is first, first magazine is coming out in, in January and we will make it available on the uh, open source. Uh, the official publications of IEEE, they are in Explorer. So you have to remember to get, uh, go to them, but this, these ones we should be able to make available. And then the education research best practices and individual chapter initiatives. These are some of some of goals. We have not gotten there yet, but that's another area that we want to put into that resource center. So the whole idea is to take the initiatives and take the global network of education and research and and filter that what makes sense to put in there and then put it on this collaboration model, which is to plan, build, and uh, integrate, operate means review it, continuous feedback, and keep on doing that. That way, it will automatically filter out the best material that we, we have on the resource center. And then we are connecting that resource center with other sister societies so that membership on uh, at large can, can, can get the benefit, including Micro 101. Um, uh, with uh, Terry Sisko, he was on the uh, in the audience as well. So the resource center is coordinated by IEEE at the top level. There are 24 active societies. They have their own resource center. We have added the MTT resource center now this year, and there are something like five to six thousand products available on demand, and there are about 378,000, 400,000 users of the resource center for all societies. Ours is very, very new, and I'll show you the, the data, what it looks like for, for MTT. And um, the whole idea is to make this resource center available to uh, MTT as members free of charge. <clears throat> and then people who are not MTT as members, they will pay a nominal charge and people, uh, but IEEE members. If they are not IEEE members, then they pay a higher charge. And the whole idea is not to really, uh, you know, this is not a money-making uh, activity. This is to encourage people to join the society if they have interest in the content. Uh, so that's that's the model that we have, we, we are using. And this is what it looks like. It's already launched. Um, it's on-demand technical training in the resource center and the link is provided here. 
Uh, so it's available from anywhere in the world on demand as needed. We are putting all the webinars that we have done so far under education committee. Uh, there are about 60, 50 to 60 of those. Uh, so there are 60 hours of instructions which can be used. And then there is a IEEE learning network called ILN. So selectively, some of the content, particularly short courses are enabled from the resource center into the uh, a learning center and the idea of learning center is that there are people who are working in the areas across um, you know somebody who's doing communication uh, part of communication society also need to access material from microwaves so they can be members on both sides or the uh, the some of the generic stuff that that is valuable can be put on the learning network. So that is being made available. Uh, we launched it in August, right before the virtual IMS. And so these are the this is the data of usage from January 1 to September 10th. We have about 1300 page views. Uh, new users were at 220. And one thing I'm so glad to notice, I just pulled it out today, that the largest users recently for last week have been from India, which is about 25, 28% next is United States, then Italy, France, and United Kingdom. So I think this is the trend I wanted to see that the countries where this information can be very valuable as students are not in colleges, they can still learn from this material. And some of the top, um, webinars that have been accessed are the uh, trans receiver architecture beyond 5G and CMOS systems on chip. Uh, so the, you, you can see that, so, so, uh, the microbiological cell. Um, so so these, these we keep looking at the statistics, but since the launch is very recent, I wanna make sure that everybody's aware of that. And then we are planning to IMS 2020 concluded. It was, uh, the content was available after still uh, September 30th for those who registered. So now that content is, we are trying to filter out the plenary sessions, the closing session, the panel sessions, the uh, 3MT, comp uh, 3MT computation and micro apps and port it over. That requires permissions and all that from our point of view. But once we get that, we will integrate into the resource center. It will become available to everybody. Um, uh, Roshandas talked about the Sigma V initiative, which we launched in 2017. And one of the things we did there was recognize that some of the colleges have a handicap. They don't even have the measuring equipment. Uh, so they, it's very hard to go in microwaves beyond Maxwell's equation and some theoretical stuff. So these kits, um, which are produced by IIT Delhi, we have been distributing them through uh, Professor Call as a regional coordinator. Actually, we have done it outside India as well. Maximum of them are in India, India, Sri Lanka. You are sent to Peru, to Mexico. And uh, personally, I would like to see each one of them with each student chapter. Uh, the reason being that these kits can be used to build a system by putting dividers, combiners, and, and active uh, amplifiers. You can put a receiver, you can put a transmitter together. And by measurements, uh, there's a better learning. Um, and this is again, one of the topics that came out uh, uh, at, uh, at some of the education forums that he had, and uh, Professor Raghavan was part of that. And there are others, so webinars idea came from that, and how to make the uh, education uh, accessible and available um, around around the world and particularly in the countries which have potential uh, was something that we were trying to do. We are still look, working on a lot of things in Sigma V initiative, including um, archival content, uh, generation of quality video content, uh, new educational methods, uh, local workshop and conferences, and also student level chapter participation. The question is, how do we control the quality? It has to be at a level that it can be deployed at an international level, right? It can't be just anything and everything. So that's that's something we are trying to work on. And one of the um, uh, pilot program I did with the IIT Durki was, can the webinars be used for educational instructional purposes. And uh, Professor Karun Rabat, uh, he took three of the webinars and asked his students as part of the regular curriculum to listen to them, 
to rate them. So there were, you can see one of them, the mobile wireless communication systems and RF technologies got, got maximum interest and maximum ratings. And the others was the, the advanced linearization was a little less, it's more focused. But what was nice was that the students were able to create their own webinars that they presented at the in the university itself. And, and that's how you stimulate, uh, you know, the world-class information that we provide to colleges and our chapters, and then they can take off from their improve, enhance their learning, compete with each other and, and uh, become better engineers in the process. Uh, there is a, since IMARC 2020 didn't take place this year because of COVID, we have a student design contest uh, announced and that's what Professor Call was talking about. I am. I wanted to get this thing going. Uh, their design is a software hardware based design challenge. Um, so it could be implementation of a circuit or subsystem on a simulator. It could be a computer program, um, and uh, it could be suggested by a software manufacturer or by students. Uh, the, the, you know, this this is delayed in launching because of COVID problems. Our idea was to make it software centric, so that by end of the year we get some uh, some uh, project reports and we evaluate that. And before the year rolls out, we will be able to fund some of these requirements that people want to develop next year, and then present at IMARC 2021. So that was the idea, and we are still pursuing that. Uh, Roshanda talked about uh, the MTT SAT challenge. So that is uh, um, already there. Uh, I won't go over that. Uh, let me stop here and let's go into Q&A. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Gupta, again, uh, for the initial uh, remarks on the uh, topic of the panel. So before uh, I open the session, in fact, I have collated a few queries from my volunteers from the Kerala chapter of MTTS. So I'll take a couple of questions from that, and then we'll uh, make the panel open for all the participants and uh, some of the dignitaries. So my first query is to uh, Professor uh, Henderson, which is basically a combination of two points. You have covered some of that. So can you please mention the specific, uh, you know, uh, impetus by which we can uh, motivate the students, especially the UG students for joining IEEE as well as entity society. So this is the first part of the question. Mm -hmm. And the second part of the question is, can MTTS consider some special initiative for UG students in regional conferences like poster competition or thesis competition, where there won't be any rejection so that, you know, they can come, they can attend the event, and they can get benefited because you know typical paper presentation means there will be some rejection in, in fact quite high rejection as far as the mtts <laughs> conferences are concerned so how we can open the forum in a more uh, you know a cohesive manner for the ug students over to you okay so i, I <clears throat> so uh, in terms of benefits so let's say for example um if you would want something that's no rejection, then to me, you need to be a member of the society to be able to take advantage of a benefit of that type. For, so um, when I came to um, IMARC, when I went to IMARC last year in 2019, there was that additional funding that was available to support students to travel. And I think we essentially accepted everybody. Yes. For that, yeah. but they had to be MTTS uh, members in order to to come. So sometimes that's a function of the budget. Uh, and what we are currently finding happening is that uh, we do want to support students as as many conferences as we uh, we sponsor now. And so we're talking about how do we expand the program, like the IMS PhD sponsorship initiative. And uh, these others that are, that one last year was driven from MGA, from a membership's perspective. So, so there are cons uh, discussions going on about that. I don't know exactly. I talked to the president of the society going for today, this morning before our call. And so we know that we can get monies from an initiative 
putting it in the budget is is maybe a challenge, but we have a surplus that we can sometimes tap into, but that's sort of year by year. And when, uh, but when programs from the conference itself are developed, like what uh, Ramesh is talking about, when you have good content, then of course somebody wants to cover it and sponsor it. So I, uh, and then to go back to the first question, as an undergrad, if you're going to remain as an electrical engineer, I think it's important to have a home where you can grow from. And, and so uh, I personally believe electromagnetics and allied, applied electromagnetics is the best home for an electrical engineer. So I have this personal bias. And so for that reason, it's important to it's just like a medical doctor. A medical doctor has to continue to get certified. They can't just, you know, have gone through med school and maybe done some kind of fellowship and then just, I mean, they can do that, but if they want to continue to offer assistance to their patients, they should re go back and look at the, the research and the, what's going on. And so I think being connected to the society, you know, that would be beneficial. To your overall career. Yeah. Yeah. Can 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 I just add yeah, a comment please, here? Please. Yeah. Please. Yeah. So so I think there are two things. I know um, one is that any initiative that uh, you think of, you know, you have to formally submit it uh, through education committee, and then you know it get considered. Um, but uh, I just wanted to uh, comment on this uh, without rejection issue. Uh, the the challenge is that you know there is a always a limited. Uh, uh, funding and lim more more importantly, the logistics are very demanding, and okay. and you know we the society wants to encourage students at undergraduate level to start getting their interest into microwaves, and one way to sort of create that interest is to create local competitions at each each college and universities, and then create some regional competitions in, in different areas, particularly in a country size of India, that's huge. Um, and then if we could have a program with the, you know, the winners of uh, those regional competitions, they need to come to IMARC, for instance, and uh, compete with each other. You know, that's the way to encourage uh, both, uh, you know, generation and understanding of the subject and also uh, rewarding people who who do well. So that's my my model yeah. of, you know, yeah, I, I think you have, you have you have given an excellent suggestion, like, uh, you know, providing it in the regional level and taking it up to the higher level. Right. That's right. So, yeah. Yeah. So I have a focused question to you, uh, Dr. Gupta. Like you talked about the MTTS uh, initiative in creating digital content, especially which is more meaningful in this era of uh, pandemic, post COVID pandemic. So, can you please uh, highlight the procedures uh, to approach to the society if you have a proposal uh, to make a, a content on certain specific area? Suppose I want to have a proposal, so how to approach and what are the funding possibilities and uh, et cetera? Yeah, so right now, as as I mentioned, you know, the resource center has been a a major effort. It's not even the all the webinars are not in there yet. To tell you frankly, we just wanted to launch it. We are about eighty to ninety percent there, um, and we are still evolving. And we are trying to kind of prioritize our activities to get the most impactful content in there as quickly as possible. And and uh, webinars was the uh, one target because you, you know we didn't want to lose all that information a lot a lot of good information was there and it is all by experts in the field um, same thing we are trying to do with the international micro symposium where by the way the rejection rate uh, of uh, highly uh, researched contributed papers is close to 50 percent so so it is it is very tough to get a paper in there now after that content has been delivered year after year uh you know how much of it really remains uh and that's that's where we want to put that archival input particularly the one that we can uh put free of cost and there are some constraints on courses and things like that where people pay for it how do we charge them on the on the resource center, we have the ability to do that. So that that all is being worked out now. When it comes to the chapter level content, uh, any proposal that you want to submit, uh, send it to me, 
and I will take it from there. Uh, and, and we will try to see what can be done. But if you send a proposal, uh, you know, put the objective on the top and what exactly is being proposed and how will it benefit uh, the, uh, the society at large, right? MTT society. So we want to be inclusive uh, and we want to open up the same opportunity to all chapters, all countries um, in the world, uh, you know, rather than being selected. So, so that's the idea, but we will welcome any proposals. Uh, yeah. You know, I, I see, I see a yeah, question I'm, here I'm, that I can read. I can answer that if, if you like. It. Yeah, I see that present IT, IEEE student chapters are limited to IITs and IIT is a few more top institutes. Please try to involve the other institutions also. Uh, I just want to be very uh, clear here. Thank you for asking the question. Um, uh, there is no limit on, you know, we are not trying to be selective with the IIT. As a matter of fact, our PhD program, each time I run it for the PhD student competition, we make sure that the students are mixed between uh, the top institution like IIT because of the competitiveness and uh, NIITs and, and other institutions uh, so that there is a better collaboration. Um, so, so if NIT wants to make a ch uh, chapter and I triple uh, IIT <laughs> tries to make a chapter, you will get the support from MTT right away. Uh, so somebody has to take the initiative, do the proper paperwork and and uh, if help is needed, Professor Shipman call is the right person to guide guide the process through. Thank you, Dr. Gupta. In between, I had some technical glitch for, for a minute or so, so I couldn't follow for a minute. So now it's over to the audience. You may uh, ask question to the panel members directly. Please unmute. Uh, you can ask the question on first come first up basis, or you can uh, put your question in the chat box as well. Many entities, uh, student band chapter chairs, and uh, some leaders. So you may please feel free to ask your questions because this okay. is a rare opportunity. Yeah. So uh, I see a question about uh, applying for the PhD fellowships. I'm I'm not sure if uh, it's the the graduate fellowships or the PhD student sponsorship initiative. But if it's a PhD fellowship. Um, what's required primarily is uh, a faculty member who is your mentor. Uh, the student needs to be, I think, uh, less than two years. They need to be within two years of graduating, uh, and they have to provide their uh, their uh, transcript, and uh, they also need to write a proposal for the type of research that they would want to do, and it's... Uh, it's reviewed by uh, a set of judges. And uh, I think that's it. You also would need a reference letter from that faculty member. I think you do need to be a member of MTTS for that, uh, but it's it's judged and, and then evaluated. And so um, I think in the, in the, I know in the medical fellowships, they only give two per year, but in the PhD fellowships, they give so right now. I think we have thirty-seven applicants, and they will probably award ten to eleven out of that. So it's, uh, I guess, it's about uh, what is it? Four out of ten is the uh, twenty yeah. twenty-five percent. Yeah. Yeah. It's good actually. Yeah. So, so you know, I just want to emphasize. I we, we have had students from India submit. There was also uh, one or two times. A student from India won the competition. It is very hard competition because you have to be at that quality level to to win it. It is international; it's open to all countries. And as uh, Roshanda mentioned, there are 37 applicants, and that's that's really one out of four who is going to get selected. 
-hmm. and that is through a multiple review process, three level review process. Yeah. And then there's there's the undergraduate pre-graduate fellowship. So that is for students who are transitioning out of their undergraduate into the master's program. Uh, that one, uh, it has, there are more opportunities to apply. So two times per year. And, uh, and so we tend to need more students to apply. So uh, you can go onto the website and see what are the specific requirements that are defined as pre-graduate you may be uh, uh, in that state and so you should consider it. it's a little less money but um you know it gives you an opportunity and i don't think the threshold is as great for that one as it is for the phd thank you we mm -hmm. have uh, dr dinesh jadov with us he's uh, the from uh, you know the western part of india is the entity very active entities uh, volunteers dr jadob you may please ask uh, hello sir query. Yeah. so much to thank dr sir uh, 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 sir, thank you so much for that initiative. So, uh, sir, uh, we have MD students, more than 25 to 30 students as a member of that society. And, sir, my question is because uh, these young minds nowadays, these are more motivating towards the startup and entrepreneurship related activity. So, uh, do we guide them related to the microwave RF uh, related community that these are the startups you can do at the undergraduate level if there are any suggestion at your side as being a mentor i can communicate the student and uh, second important thing i just uh, joined uh, as a assistant director of ESL in my institution and what i am found in one of the activity that uh, if i want to generate the interest of the student for particular uh, training program or the participation first of all we have conducted one training session can we do one regional type of activity yeah. or session for the student? Thank you, Dr. Jadav. Yeah, over to uh, both of you. Yeah, please. So, yeah, okay. So th th there are a um, couple of questions. One is that how to motivate the undergraduate students and how to define the project. Second is can we do a regional competition, right? On the, on the first one, you know, the, because RF and uh, microwaves is a relatively, you know, it's, it's a harder field because it, it particularly hands on uh, the, the, um, the moment people look at uh, Maxwell's equations, many of them faint. And, and that's one of the, one of the challenges. Um, uh, and that is really not, you know, in India, actually, people are able to do much better than I have seen here. So, <laughs> so it's, it's not a negative, um, uh, but I think, um, uh, you know the, um, the, the there is a number one there is a site program that is called special interest group on uh, um, humanitarian humanitarian yeah mm -hmm. yeah so so you know if there are people who are interested given given the covid environment uh, i think there is more focus on uh, humanity than ever was and mm -hmm. if we can uh, at the undergraduate level uh, even part of the major project define a project and and remember uh, mtt is from megahertz to terahertz so any project which involves rf and microwaves and that also helps the uh, society uh, as on humanitarian grounds uh, that will be very appropriate and it can be a motivational uh, factor as well given the uh, given the circumstances we do have undergraduate scholarships as uh, Rishanda mentioned um, and we uh, we should encourage students at undergraduate level uh, particularly in the final year to put a proposal together and you know well written proposal with f faculty mentorship so that it can win and and there is money available fifteen hundred dollars i think per winner uh, and and the competition is there there are about 20 of those uh, 10 in spring 10 in fall and uh, you know those, those are very good vehicles to be able to uh, to get some funds more importantly to compete at a level where you can win i think you know 
it's less important if you are, if you, even if you people try, they will learn something, right? And it is only through trial a few times, they will see what works, what doesn't work. But, you know, you have to, they have to compete at international level, which is a good thing. And that's exactly what uh, the society is looking for. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Thank you, uh, Dr. Gupta, for uh, nicely highlighting the point uh, as far as uh, Dr. Jadav's uh, is concerned. Yeah. yeah, but I do want to talk, uh, answer your second part of the question, which is the regional competition. And I think the regional competition, you know, it is it, it is not for MTT to decide. It is for the local chapters to decide. And and the Sigma V uh, initiative, which was a special interest group, group in microwave and wireless education, uh, Dr. Call is actually he chairs that particular committee under as a as a uh, as a vice chair for education committee, and if there is a program that can be put together in India, where different regions can compete among themselves and then bring at a national level, I think that will be that will be great. That will perfectly fit into the uh, Sigma Sigma V initiative. And once we have that project outlined. Uh, then we can take it to uh, adcom and and get uh, get funding for those those kinds of projects thank you thank you thank you thank you anyone else from the audience maybe that is uh, the deep professor siddiqui uh, yeah. yeah i i won't take i think it's already uh, much time but i won't won't take too much time I have a small question, especially to Professor Rashund. I don't know whether it has been uh, answered already in this podium or not, because I was at a call. I went away for five minutes or so. The thing is that uh, she talked about this uh, CMOS and several uh, high frequency circuits. And I think Professor Kaul also mentioned that fabricating and foundry things are probably a little bit problematic from Indian perspective. So, but we can design and we can uh, do the uh, validation part. So, uh, is there any way MTT can bridge the uh, gap or any kind of uh, program that uh, people can do something from here? I think it's going something related to the collabor uh, internship or collaboration type of things. So, any facilitating with the industry, any channel that MTT can provide or any thoughts on that? I would like to ask to both Professor Rashunda and also. Uh, yeah, a very good question to both of you. Okay, so I wrote it down. That was the first thing I did, but I think that so so it's it tends to be expensive, but it, I think it has a lot to do with the word you use collaboration. Uh, so, for example, I that that opportunity for me was funded through another uh, funding agency, and if we as faculty start to interact, and and I know. If opportunity to get on and say I've covered the costs and I say okay you can put you know I can give you a small amount of space but to put on there but we need to start having those conversations because you need to know in advance and it's also access to the technology sometimes that's uh, limited but like I, I think even if let's say you had an idea and maybe you couldn't implement it on the chip, you could say to me and I could pass it on to my students. But that, you know, imagine that might take us a year and a half, you know, we start the conversation today. And then when that opportunity presents itself, I say, okay, I'm ready, Dr. Sarkar, you know, this is coming, we have a few months. But I think it's it's through those, those channels and starting to communicate like this virtual way and then developing a real, uh, ideas with colleagues and saying, hey, I think I, I have an idea. I'd like you to consider it and maybe we can co work on it and then it could lead to actually some implementation. We could send you chips and then it can be a, a paper in the future. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks, thanks for, thanks for that. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, so my, my, t my take on that question is that, uh, you know, there is local industry in India, I assume there are foundries there. Um, maybe you have to send them outside. And then there is, you know, last time we talked about the government industry and student participation. This is the ideal kind of idea, the thought that you can promote there. Uh, you know, I think uh, if, if the if government is, um, 
you know, funding some of these initiatives for Atam Nagar Bharat and, and, you know, for, for being self sufficient. These are exactly the kind of things that should happen where uh, it is, it is the, the student body and people who have idea and they want to really learn versus industry that defines the need versus the government that supports that need. Uh, you know, that that's what really needs to happen. Uh, if this has to succeed, um, uh, to, to the extent MTT can help, I think that's where you're going. Um, I personally think that it is harder for MTT to selectively fund these kind of projects. We'll have to have a program defined within uh, MTT, and MTT is global in nature, and and you know it gets a little complicated to get that budget assigned. Um, but I think at, at I think this is an idea that you must. Uh, address with Professor Call. If he can, yeah. he will find a way. Yeah. 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 Thanks. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank very much. I, I think you have nicely. Both of you have nicely summarized uh, the answer of this question. Just my from my perspective, what I uh, I feel uh, from this podium and many uh, such experiences. Even if MTTS can't directly help, the interaction with this uh, type of yeah. you know uh, stalwarts, leaders, academicians, industrialists probably will create many link and through that mm. probably many things which is not possible in someone's campus with limited infrastructure can be done. <laughs> so field yeah. networking that happens through this MTT, uh, MTTS uh, podium or virtual podium nowadays also. So, yeah. so, so you know, the, the previously we discussed about, uh, you know, students, the competition, the um, regional competitions and and going through this, I think that's that's you know what we said before, that if he if the chapters in a particular region can start working together, and they have a regional competition even for something like this, and then, you know they there is a design which is which is already developed by four or five or six designs which have been done through and they've gone through the filtering process, so the success rate is fairly, you know, uh, eventual success rate is high at least it has to be high. And then it is much easier uh, to find a f uh, funding source to to make that happen. In absence of that, it becomes uh, much more challenging. And this is this is where the alignment of uh, internal alignment comes into play. And uh, and I think Professor Call will be very much supportive of yeah. those kinds of initiatives. In the direction of uh, Dr. Gupta and Professor Call that we had interacted uh, last time for virtual podium. I think this type of initiative is already on and indirectly through our network, we have already on this uh, type of initiative to guide the local students, uh, I mean, especially from the colleges who are a little bit underprivileged, not having the proper facilities. So through our own networking, not exactly through MTTS podium or MTTS platform, we have already started these activities, probably with professor's call support and uh, also support from the society. We can make it uh, more uh, you know, from regional level. We can take it to the national level. Uh, I believe so. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and I think that Professor Call had mentioned last time that there are four thousand engineering colleges, and and you yeah. know the employability of the students is a challenge because um, you know many of them don't have the hands-on experience. I and mean, this is exactly yeah. the kind of thing that um, you know they will not get hands-on unless they 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 see something for themselves right and that will happen being in a competition saying i can produce something it will go somewhere yeah. it will eventually help somebody you know and that's really what partnership has to look like right right i think yeah. we have professor uh, siddiqui uh, also uh, he might uh, you know, ask the panel something what do you said uh, yes uh, you know like uh, Professor Gupta, Dr. Gupta, you mentioned about uh, scaring the students by showing them natural situations, and that is where they, you know, they really fall out. But then um, we have a trend, like in electrical engineering, and especially in electronics engineering, in electromagnetics, they learn electromagnetics, but they land up with a job in software companies, right? Uh, we have a dearth of Industry now, MTDS society is driven by industry. That is the difference between APS society, AP society, and the MTDS society. So the MTDS society is driven by industry. But if you look at India, most of the jobs in micro sector are either in ISRO or in the or in defense DRDO. But we have this dearth of a lack of industry, private industries, other than Astra or few of them in India. So 
what would be your suggestion? I mean, training, creating manpower is fine, but if they don't land up with a proper job, we need entrepreneurs who can, uh, we need an initiative, a directive where we can have more private industries and private more opportunities for the students to land up with jobs where they can get some hand up hands on experience in this field. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, once again, I'm going to, you know, this is, this is a, um, you know, what uh, actually um, is very interesting to me that when you look at India as a country and look at the infrastructure and the size of the economy and, and you know, the capability of people, um, you know, it kind of surprises me that we are not, the, the, the country is not where it, it uh, could be. And, and it could be because, you know, the, all of the institutions are pretty well working um, sort of independent of each other. And, uh, you know, these, these, on the other hand, these things, these initiatives require uh, some level of coordination and uh, more investment. Um, so uh, when Professor Saha talked about the industry, the government initiative to encourage uh, uh, you know, engineering and uh, self-dependency and, and uh, cre creating products. I mean, these are the areas which come to my mind that, um, you know, there got to be a mechanism built in there. The society can only help once we see that there is a right proposal and, you know, how we can make sure that the initiative succeeds in the end. Uh, but, you know, society cannot uh, doesn't have the resources, doesn't have the manpower. I think what, what you know, my, my again, I'm coming back to the kind of Sigma V initiatives when we started distributing these kits, these are meant for student chapters. I'd like to see every college having a uh, student chapter gets a kit, gets their hand, hands-on experience there, and then they have access to the software and they can say, I can improve that. And, and you know, that's the kind of activity that has to take place uh, locally. Uh, you know, how do we get it there uh, from where we are? Uh, you know, is something that I cannot comment on that because I am not, I'm not there. But I think I'm sure pro people like Professor Ragman, Professor Call, Professor Siddiqui, if they put their minds to it, um, uh, you know, there has to be a local solution that has to come out. <laughs> Yeah, definitely it's challenging, but it's definitely doable and we need to have a roadmap for that. Yes. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, uh, so, Dr. Gupta and Professor Siddiqui for uh, nicely, you know, and, uh, nicely addressing this particular question. So I believe we are at the very fag end of this particular panel discussion and for the whole day, uh, you know, thank you very much for all your time, valuable time efforts, but before last two questions so the first of that question is to I, uh, direct it to dr rasunda we hear a lot about women in microwave women in engineering women on antennas also from ap society and i am very happy to mention that current ap president is uh, professor mata uh, she is a woman and uh, we had dominic uh, year before the president mtts and you are currently uh, president elect for 2021. So what is the motivation and what is the extra mileage that we get uh, by promoting these women in microbe? I just want to hear from you. Yeah. Uh, well, I think that First of all, well, I, I guess I was getting ready to say that maybe in India, the number of female engineers is more than, I, I think that they can still perhaps be what you would call fewer number, fewer women in the room, for example. But I'm, I started to say something, but I've had a class maybe of 50 students and maybe 20% uh, of them almost were women. And, but they, women bring a different perspective. You know, they bring something to the table that uh, oftentimes uh, can be linked to the social side of things. Not that we can't do the technical piece, but we also um, have a, that ability to nurture oftentimes. So we just will approach a problem from a different angle and oftentimes uh, can 
that can be that thing that makes a, a huge difference in, in considering, especially when you think about products. Um, oftentimes men are just, they're sort of single-minded, but a woman will consider like, well, what do I do for myself? What about my family? How do I implement these kinds of things? And um, I just think that in the next several years, you know, you'll have an opportunity to, uh, at least from my perspective, I'm very interested in relationships, establishing these networks, just as Ramesh said, uh, and helping people to collaborate better. And so if we can, through email presidents, sort of facilitate that and encourage that. And, you know, there's still competition, but there's also in the process of competing, let's go about this and all of us win. You know, you may still have to find a victor, but all of the whole team is going to be successful in the process of, of going, say, to that next step. So, yeah, and that, that's how I see it now. Other women are very, very competitive and, and, and have other aspects or thoughts that they bring. But that's my thought. Uh, Ramesh, what do you think? <laughs> what have you seen? Well, well you know, I'll, I'll tell you again, um, I, you know, I, I, I would... I would say the, in India, the woman engineering actually is a uh, woman in engineering um, is very impressive. As a matter of fact, if you, you know, one of the things that people notice, I notice when the uh, mission to Mars was successful, how many women were in the room uh, handling a space program? And that probably yeah. was an eye opener. And, and uh, then the question comes up. You know why are they not on the forefront as being in the you know in the in the professional careers? I I think there is a lot of opportunity in India to um, pull those uh, women engineers into the fold, so to say, uh, by you know creating a affinity group in the local sense. I think I think um, nothing about Indian males, but the males have a tendency to kind of connect together. <laughs> uh at a social level and uh, you know and and uh, they do feel excluded at times um and if there is a sp separate affinity group locally you know where they can uh find that connectivity and and you know it's, it's, it's a challenge to the chapters as well how to make them more more connected actually i was very pleased to see there are many women volunteers in this particular group uh in this initiative that that's that's awesome and so mm -hmm. those are the kind of things that will bring them out they have to have responsibility they have to deliver to those responsibilities and that enhances commitment mm -hmm. and uh, that enhances also their ability to uh, pull other people so so and and you know again i i think there is an opportunity uh um Roshanda, we have been friends and colleagues for a long time but there is one thing that uh, i'm very excited about that you are the president elect and you can become the role model uh, for for promoting that particular right. activity. Right. Yeah. yeah. I agree. Thank you very much. I think, uh, you know, the but the versions, I mean, the, uh, the your point exactly matches with the IEEE Women in Engineering goal. I, uh, you know, it's uh, from IEEE website. I read it quote unquote, inspire, engage, encourage, and empower IEEE women worldwide. So that's right. the key point. And I remember we had a specific panel in this particular direction in IMAC 2019 to talk about mm -hmm. women in microwave, which was a very successful session. Mm -hmm. And as a matter of fact, I just want to mention that the two SBC, MTTS SBC, we are having in both those SBCs, the chairs are, uh, you know, women, Ms. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Ms. Sibada. Oh, that's okay. wonderful. Yeah. yeah. So today, I mean, with this, uh, we have the last question, which I'll be focusing directly to Dr. Gupta. Can you please talk on the volunteering opportunities in MTTS education and Marcom committee for for okay. all fronts, like uh, young yeah. professionals, professionals, senior people, and so on. Yeah. Yeah. So I I, I think that, <laughs> that there are there are opportunities. You know the. Um, uh, you know, question is why should people volunteer in the first place, right? And and uh, that is because um, it is about connectivity. It is about um, you know giving back to the society. Um, 
you know, and giving giving back to the profession what you and you you connect across, and then you benefit out of that because you learn from others, and then you're motivated to contribute at that particular uh, uh, level. That's why I do it. I do it because um, you know I have, a, I have a full schedule, but I I want to make time uh, because uh, if it was not for my um, you know, my first paper I presented at a conference that landed me at a job in Comsat, which was totally amazing to me. Uh, if I had not been there, I wouldn't have benefited from that. And after that, I started volunteering uh, as a chapter cha cha chapter activities locally in DC, and then on uh, international micro symposium, and that led me to uh, get to um, uh, to chair the technical program at IMS 2011 in Baltimore. And because of that, um, I got into ERCOM and I got education committee to run, although I'm not an educator, I'm an industry, right? But uh, um, so so the opportunities come. I think the the um, volunteering is something that you do not, not for self benefit as much for contributing back to people. And once you do that, there is a different level of satisfaction that comes with it and a different kind of recognition that comes with it. And that really carries it over to your personal profession. Uh, you know, it's not isolated, uh, but, but uh, you know, there has to be that connectivity in people's mind that I want to do this because I want to connect with people. I want to learn something. I want to contribute back. And all of those, is, the, those are good objectives. I'm not sure if I quite answered your question, but you know, I have addressed a lot of issues I know people have it in their mind in terms of volunteering. I think it's, it's uh, something wonderful if you can do it, particularly. Yeah. But but do it as an impactful vol volunteering. Being volunteer, being volunteer sake, to me is not helpful. You know, if I, I do it because I want to bring about a uh, about a change definitely. which can be permanent. Yeah, definitely. I understand. I understand for benefits of all the youngsters and all the professionals. I just raise this particular point so that you know they can know about the spectrum of opportunities so with this right. we conclude uh, this particular uh, excellent day you know uh, with two talks and excellent panel discussion whatever you have seen the focused activities and whatever has applauds the mtts color chapter has received over the last few weeks because of our activities is because of the real heroes of the chapter my uh, fellow office bearers and the two student branches we are having MTTS GC Barton Hill and MTTS IST student branch. So these are the people who are working at the back end always. And uh, you know, I would, would be very happy to see you and welcome you in uh, physical condition in the next year sometime. So these are some uh, epitome of Kerala. Probably will be very happy to have you, uh, you know, in a physical workshop sometime in 2021 or 2022. And this is the very beautiful beach, which is uh, pretty close to my house. It's 30 kilometers from here. Oh my gosh. It's the famous Kovalam beach. So we'll be really happy to have an event there itself sometime. I hope so. So with this, we are going to conclude this. And I request our uh, faculty advisor, uh, Sri Anu Mohammed, to propose the formal vote of thanks of the day. Over to you, Anu. Anu Muhammad? He, is he mute? Anu, please unmute yourself. I see you are there. Oh, okay. So I don't know, maybe there is some issue at his end. So I'll... Uh, on behalf of the chapter, I myself, Anu, you are there? Hello, Anu. Sir, some kind of issue. Uh, the vote of thanks. Please go ahead. Now we can. Hello. Hear. You are audible.
anyway because he is having some connectivity issues on or his behalf i I'll, I'll do this particular uh, duty so once again uh, thank you very much to dr anderson as well as dr gupta i think when you started the day uh, with our uh, the virtual podium probably hardly you had your bed and probably now lunch time for you and also for the participants is probably uh, i mean already a late uh, for indian dinner so thank you very much for the overwhelming response to all my all the participants and all the office bearers for their uh, tireless service for last several weeks i mean always we are maintaining a periodic fashion in every month we are having a particular uh, l4 event and we'll uh, try to keep it up in this way so uh, thanks to the session chairs dr sharkar and uh, dr emmanuel for nicely uh, conducting the sessions and helping us and of course uh, thanks to uh, professor call dr siddiqui my other fellow office bearers uh, sri arijit mitro sri anu mohammad the students sibada afshad some of the other students gopika vinod elizabeth and many other students uh, in who have been the backbone of this particular event and last but not the least most sincere thanks from the bottom of my heart to the speakers uh, dr handerson and dr ramesh gupta so with this we call it a day thank you very much and for others stay thank tuned you. with us we'll keep it up for the future versions also thank you very much thank you thank, thank you, you and a good, good night to all of you particularly in india yeah. i think yes. it's really late thank for you, you. Yes. have a good day yeah. yeah thank you okay thank you okay bye 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 volunteers you may uh, officially close the meeting yes sir